Thank you. Please be seated. Before going to the record, we approach. Yes. So.
All the various present and accounted for. All right, thank you, Mr. Bill. Please be seated. All right, good morning, everyone. We're back on the record on case CR 22211623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Abel. This is the second day of introduction of evidence in the state's case of chief, although the state is here and present. Mr. Wood was conducting examination of a witness. Uh, Mr. Wood, is the state ready to proceed this morning? Yes, sir. Very well. All of you the defense is present, along with counsel and the defendant. The court also notes the jurors are all properly seated and all 18 jurors have returned. The court's also confirmed that the jurors each completed their affirmation this morning regarding uh, not looking into the case during the break. And so we appreciate you following that admonishment as well. Um, one other matter I just wanted to bring up before we got started with additional evidence is the court's live streaming this hearing and this trial uh, there are, there is a, uh, I heard there were some complaints that the audio maybe wasn't coming through very well on that. I'd ask the attorneys if they could to talk right into the mics. Of course, that helps as well with our <clears throat> court reporter making the record. In addition, the live stream comes directly through the court's official channel. That can be somewhat Difficult to find if you go to the Idaho Supreme Court website. However, there is a website on Ada County uh, about this trial. And if you just Google the term Ada County Daybell trial, there's an easy link to find for the court's official live stream. And that's the most direct signal. So for those that are observing the trial online, if you're having any issues with audio or quality of the signal, perhaps you could uh, go to that direct signal, which is the best source of the live stream proceeding. So uh, with that, then we had Detective Hermosillo was on the stand yesterday, and I believe he was continuing direct examination. Is that correct, Mr. Wood? Yes, sir. All right, I'll have the witness recalled then if you're ready to proceed with additional testimony. Thank you.
All right, uh, Detective Hermosillo was sworn in yesterday. I'll remind you, you are still under oath for your testimony today. And to confirm, uh, not being the state's case agent, I just want to confirm that you didn't uh, review any, well, universal witness, so we don't need to do that on this particular witness. So, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to just inquire on further direct, you can do that at this time. All right, thank you. Good morning, detectives. Good morning. Second, when we finished off yesterday, we were discussing what you had found or what you had observed at a burial site and just for purposes of the jury, uh, what what site were you at uh, when you found the body you were speaking of yesterday? We were at uh, the site that we deemed JJ's burial site. Uh, and, and where, Your Honor, if I could be given states exhibit 10A. And if I may publish that. Yes, it's admitted, correct? Yes. So. Detective, if you could, for reason, just for purposes of clarification, with a pointer, point out uh, the location you were speaking of. It's the burial site on the other side of this pond, just underneath this tree. Okay. Now, you call it a pond when you were out there on June 9th. Was there water in it? No, there wasn't. Okay. And... And again, just to clarify, at, at, when we had left off your testimony yesterday, is it correct that you had, that you, what you observed was uh, what appeared to be a small body wrapped up in a black plastic bag? That's correct. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed State's Exhibits 10B. Through 10 M. Detective, can you review those exhibits and let me know when you've had a chance to?
Deck of you read in state's exhibits 10B through 10M? Yes. What do they report to be? Photographs. There's a photograph of the west side of the defendant Daybell's residence and oh. photographs of the backyard. Um, and do you know when these photographs were taken? On June 9th, 2020. Were you the photographer? No. But you were on the property that day? That's correct. And were you able to observe each of the areas that are photographed in these exhibits? Yes. You saw them with your own eyes? Yes. And are these true and accurate representations of what you observed on June 9th, 2020? Yes. Your Honor, I'm referring to Commission of State's Exhibits 10B through 10M. Any objection? Judge, just to into the microphone, please, Mr. Pryor. Sorry. I'm sorry, Judge. Judge, just one year on 10B, if I could. Otherwise, I'm fine with the rest of the exhibits. Okay, so let's um, do that then. So 10C through 10M have been offered or admitted, and Mr. Pryor, you can board our on 10B. And officer, you're looking at uh, 10B, is that right? Yes. Right now. <laughs> yes. Okay. And the vehicle that's parked in 10B, is that the vehicle that was uh, uh, the position of the vehicle at the time that uh, you testified about Mr. Daybell? That's not the vehicle that Mr. Daybell was in. That Do you know what vehicle that is? In the driveway, looks like a super. Okay. Is that the driveway that, the, that you're making reference to? That's correct. So in other words, uh, somebody else's vehicle is there. We don't know whose vehicle that is. It's not the one that Mr. Daybell was in, no. But you don't know whose vehicle that is. I don't know whose vehicle that is. You don't know when the vehicle was put there. No, sir. You don't know who the owner of the vehicle is. That's correct. Okay. I would object, Judge, on foundation. All right, Mr. Wood. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Detective, so you don't know who, whose vehicle that is, correct? Correct. All right. But you were still there that day. Okay. Do you recognize this as Mr. Daybell's residence? Yes, I do. And this is a true and accurate representation of Mr. Daybell's residence. Yes, it is. Your Honor, I think significant or sufficient foundation has been laid. All right, Judge, I just make a record that I'm objecting also on the basis of relevance. It looks like it's a picture of a vehicle in the driveway. Okay, well, the picture shows many things, including a vehicle. I'll allow the state to have this admitted and Sufficient foundation has been established, so 10B is admitted as well as the others. Thank you. Detective, if you will, pardon me, Your Honor, may I publish? Yes. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 10B? That is the west side of the Daybell residence. When I testified earlier to coming out and standing in the long area, um, that's not the vehicle that Mr. Daybell was in, but it was similarly parked that way back then. And that's the driveway he was sitting in when I was observing him. Look over his right shoulder toward the pond area. Detective, do you have that the point on you? Can you point to where you were standing when you initially observed Mr. Daniel's behavior? I was standing here in this area. And then you you said that you you positioned yourself so that you could see what you thought he was looking at. That's correct. And where did you go then? I stood more towards the driveway area. The vehicle that Mr. Daybell was in was up further this way. It wasn't backed in as far as this vehicle in the photograph. And just to clarify, is that when you looked back and saw the activity under what became the first burial site? Well, I was looking forward at that time. I was facing this direction. 
and I aligned myself with Mr. Daybell, who was up here more, and he was looking towards this area here. Okay. Now, can you see the first burial site from where you're uh, from that location? Yes, it's the tree I spoke about earlier. This is the tree where JJ was buried underneath. This right here is the pond. You can see just the a little bit more taller shrubs around the top of the pond area. But this is the tree that JJ was buried underneath. So is it fair to say that even from the front or the middle of Mr. Abel's front yard, you can see that location easily? That's correct. Detective, what did you observe in States Exhibit C, 10C? Well, I testified I was tasked with sifting through the fire pit. Uh, this is what we deemed the fire pit. Uh, it had burnt um, tree limbs. There was various little pieces of trash. Um, it was in the middle of round center blocks. So that's what we deemed the fire pit as. And, and the way it appears in that image, that's the way you found it that day? Correct. It was that morning, yes. And what do you observe in States Exhibit 10D? This is just north of the driveway that Mr. Daybell is sitting in, looking in the same direction. So it's we're standing on the west side looking east. And that is the uh, tree. And then here's the pond area right here. I'm going to put up sticks and go to 10A again. And if you can uh, point to the approximate location of where this picture was taken from. <laughs> so that last photograph was taken from this area right here. And so it's fair to say from, from that location, you can easily see. Judge, I'm going to object at this point. Uh, there's been some leading questions. Ten years. I'll sustain that last question. Is leading. Right. From that perspective, what were you able to observe? Burial site number one. JJ's burial site. Was it difficult for you to observe it from that location? The actual uh, grave site. On the ground, yes, from that location, but where the tree and the pond are, no, it wasn't difficult. Detective, what did you observe in States Exhibit 10E? <laughs> so I testified earlier about the difference in uh, length of grass and shrubs in that six by six section that was marked off next to the pond. This is what I'm referring to. If you look close, you can see um, there's there's smaller grass and dirt protruding right here. Um, it, this is probably a little bit difficult to see. There's probably a better photograph. But this is longer shrubs through here. And then in here was, was uh, like the length of sod and some dirt where there was nothing growing. And when yesterday you testified you called over to burial site one, is that what it looked like when you got over there? That's correct. Detective, can you describe to the jury what you saw it's in States Exhibit 10F? So when I spoke about ERT removing the topsoil and the top level of shrubs, this is what I was speaking about. And you can start to see the, the three large white rocks I was talking about earlier starting to come through the dirt. 
you testified yesterday about a smell. Was this the same time that you began to smell what you described yesterday? Yes, as as soon as they removed this and um, the topsoil, that's when you instantly, I instantly can smell the smell of a decomposing body. Detective, can you tell the jury what you saw in State Specific 10? Or, I'm sorry, 10G. So as the ERT team methodically removed the soil around the white rocks and dug down just a little bit deeper, this is what we saw. You can start to see there was a smaller rock with the three large white rocks starting to show through clearly. When I testify that there was thin wood paneling underneath the white rocks, you can start to see the edge of that piece of wood paneling underneath the rocks. We also noticed that there were roots cut that the ERT team didn't cut. They were already pre-cut. Some of the roots are fairly thick, so that was something we observed as well in that burial site. Detective, can you describe the jury what you saw in states that did a 10-H? After the ERT team removed the white rocks, this is the two pieces of wood panel that were underneath. What did you observe in states that did a 10-I? I spoke earlier about the distinction in soil. Some of the soil looked wet or moist, some of it looked dry. <clears throat> Excuse me. What you're looking at here is once we removed the wood paneling, this is what was underneath. And you can start to see the distinction through here of the wet soil. And up here is just the dry soil. So the rocks and the paneling were all through here. So that was the other thing that we observed. And as we took the paneling off, the, the odor began to become a lot stronger. Um, and so we, we knew we were at the right spot. Your Honor, I apologize for any delay. I wonder if we just have a very brief sidebar regarding the removal of the sorry.
story you can continue. Thank you. Detective, can you explain to the jury what you observed in State's Exhibit 10 <clears throat> So once we, we started removing the wet soil, and I testified earlier to a black round object protruding through the dirt, this is what we started to see. It appeared to be like tight wrapped black plastic. It, it wasn't very too far from any, it's fairly shallow, but that's what we started to see. And I talked about what appeared to be the crown of a human head. Can you describe what you saw in state of 10K? So once that appeared, the ERT team leader, Steve Daniels, <clears throat> used a small, sharp instrument. And I testified that he made a slit through the black plastic. And you can see the black plastic kind of peeled away um, on the top of the head. And then I testified there was a white piece of plastic underneath. And this is the white piece of plastic here. He made a slit in the white plastic. And, and when he did that, um, you can see what appeared to be brown human hair. Um, some of the hair kind of came out with the sharp instrument, and that's the, the hair you can see on top of the white plastic. But that's what you're looking at there. Audrey, what you observed in states is at 10 L. Once the ERT team continued excavating, they removed all the soil um, on top of, of this small body that was wrapped in completely black plastic. I testified that it appeared to take the shape of a small body of black plastic. And this is what we saw here. It's probably a four by two grave, and I'm guessing at that, that, that those measurements. Um, but it, it started to take the shape of a small body, and then it had different pieces of duct tape throughout the black plastic on top. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 10M? Once we lifted JJ out of the ground, there was still wet soil underneath where he was laying. And that is, that's body decomposition. The body had to begin to break down. So that's what the wet soil is through here. Again, you can see the, the roots that were cut to be able to put in this location. Detective, once that body was recovered, uh, what did you do? Oh, and I, to clarify that question, once that body was taken out of the ground, what did you do? I assisted uh, the coroner and a few other officers in 
placing JJ in the body bag, a black body bag, uh, corner lock the body bag for evidence. We then put it in the back of the coroner's vehicle. Um, the coroner and a Fremont County deputy drove the uh, vehicle up to the morgue and myself and Lieutenant Rockwell followed behind that vehicle. Um, once we were at the morgue, uh, JJ was placed in the morgue um, and then we returned back to the Dave residence. Do you recall who the Fremont County coroner was? Brendan Dye. And do you recall what other officers traveled with you to the hospital? In my vehicle, it was just Lieutenant Ron Ball um, with the coroner, Brenda Dye, I believe it was Detective Kai Kamani. And, and just for clarification, you had said this already, I apologize, but um, where, what hospital did you take them to? Madison Memorial Hospital. And where is that located? In the city of Richmond. <clears throat> Once uh, once you finished that task, what was the next step for your investigation? That day? We returned back to uh, the Dave Bell residence. As we got there, we were told that they had possibly. Uh, Judge, I'm going to object at this point. There's some hearsay. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask another question. Yeah. Um, without telling the jury what anyone told you, what did you do when you got back to the residence? We assisted in a second burial site. And when you got back to the residence, did you observe another burial site being looked at? I did. Where was that located? So through the course of our investigation, uh, we learned that the Daybell family had deemed a section of the backyard as what they referred to as a pet cemetery. And, and we knew through talking to family members that the pet cemetery had a little uh, black dog statue next to a post that, that kind of signified where the pet cemetery was. And so when I returned back from dropping JJ off at, at the morgue, I observed ERT digging in the pet cemetery area. And did you aid in that excavation? I did. What did you personally do? ERT began taking off top layers of soil in, in this specific area in the pet cemetery. Um, once they began to again see wet soil start to protrude through the dry soil, they slowed down and um, we got on our hands and knees and began excavating that by hand. And by hand, did you use tools to do that? We did. They had small tools that we could use, uh, trowels, like paintbrushes, things of that nature. Approximately what time of day was this? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> say it was afternoon. Um, and approximately how many? People were there with you using hand tools. <clears throat> there was only a few of us um, at a time that, that could work because of the area, but also because of the smell. Um, we had to take turns digging because we were on our hands and knees, and the smell was so bad that you could only work for a few minutes before somebody else had to take turns, get on their hands and knees, and start. Digging by hand. And, and you, you said the smell, what, what did it smell like? Um, decomposing body. How long did you uh, aid in that excavation using the hand tools? Uh, hours, probably hours. And uh, did you find any? We did. We ended up um, 
digging down and started to uncover burnt pieces of flesh, charred bone, fatty tissue. Just, just, and I apologize for the lack of better words, but globs of burnt flesh starting to protrude through the dirt. Uh, and, and once you found that, uh, how long did you keep working that site that day? Um, we worked probably until probably four in the afternoon. And you mentioned ERT. Were they working there alongside you? They were. Um, they were also. There was also. Other areas being excavated as well, a fire pit still. Um, so everybody was kind of tasked with something different at that point. And, and once we started getting down a little bit more in that in Tylee's burial site, we assumed it was Tylee, we could start to see the top of what appeared to be um, something plastic and green. Um, and at that point, the ERT team leader, Steve Daniels, decided we were, we were done for the evening. That um, when you were done for the evening, what happened? We had Fremont County Sheriff's Office, uh, the Madison County Fire Department, bring in two large uh, light trucks to illuminate the crime scene. The crime scene was taped off. We had officers from Riceburg City Police, um, deputies from Fremont County Sheriff's Office that remained on scene all night long, walking the perimeter to make sure that the scene wasn't compromised and it was well illuminated. And uh, did you return the next day? Yes, we did. Now, when you return the next day, uh, who else returned? <clears throat> uh, everybody that was there the previous day. So, ERT came back? That's correct, yes. And other members of the FBI? Yes. Fremont County officers? Yes. Rexford police officers? Correct. And I believe you testified earlier that there were some attorney general investigators there as well? Yes. And they were all there that second day. That's correct. By uh, approximately what time did you arrive that second day? We started fairly early. It was approximately seven in the morning. And um, what did what did you start doing when you got there on the second day? I went back to to Ellie's burial site. Um, we put up canopies uh, to keep some light and wind. There was uh, media helicopters flying overhead, so we wanted to keep the scene from being compromised as much as we possibly could. And at that point, we got back down on our hands and knees and began digging again um, with those same little tools to to get down to see what exactly we were going to take out of the ground at that point. And um, so, so, and then what happened next? Did you continue to do that work? Like I said, we, we would take turns digging because the smell was so bad. And we, we would just keep excavating slowly around this green object that started to come through the dirt the first day. So it started to take a shape, a roundish shape, when we began digging down and methodically removing dirt. And at that point, we could start to see what appeared to be uh, the shape of, of a green melted bucket. Um, that appeared to have the remains of we assume were tightly that were charred and burned inside it. 
Uh, and were you there for the excavation of that bucket? Yes. How did that happen? Once we got down to what we thought was the bottom of the um, disformed bucket, we observed part of a, a human skull underneath the bucket. There were some teeth that we ended up excavating from underneath. Um, at that point, the goal was to lift that out of the ground. And so there was a little, we made kind of a little hole around it to try to get underneath. So we put tarps out. Um, like I said, the goal was to try to lift it completely out without manipulating it in any way. But when we tried to do that, when we lifted it, um, it all broke apart because there was nothing holding it together. So at that point, we had to go back in and remove all the pieces of the charred flesh and burnt bone and organs and pieces of tile at that point put onto the top. And uh, while you were doing that, you talked about the smell on you. Is that still present? Yes, very much so. Strong odor, yes. Were you, were you able to observe the um, lack of a better word, total removal of, of that green bucket and its contents from that excavation site? We were able to lift everything out at that point. Um, we put it on the blue tarp. There were photographs taken, measurements taken by ERT. Um, once that was completed, we dug down even further to make sure we didn't miss anything. Once we figured out everything was out of the ground, that tarp and those and Tyler's remains were then put into a body bag in the corner again, locked the body bag for evidence purposes. And Tyler was also transported to the morgue. And did you uh, did you follow along when Tyler was transferred to the morgue like you did with JJ? We did. We followed in the same manner. Um, myself and Lieutenant Ball. Once Tyler was placed in the morgue, we returned back to the Dale residence. Your Honor, I'm going to be asked to ask for the witness be handed states exhibits 11A through 11G. And Judge, for the record, I've previously reviewed these and I will object to the admission of these as exhibits. All right, exhibits 11B through 11G are admitted without objection. Yep. This time, as we get into this evidence, I'm going to announce that because of the graphic nature of some of this evidence, I'm not going to be showing this on the fourth live stream, nor to the general public in the courtroom. The jurors will be viewing the evidence as well as the parties are permitted to see that. In addition, the court will provide an opportunity for any victims that wish to see the evidence in a private setting to view it as it's now been admitted into the record. Uh, but we made arrangements to not display this to the general public. And so, Mr. Wood, with these exhibits, that's how we'll proceed. And we will not include that on the live stream, but you can discuss it on the record uh, and open public with the witness. Can you review that exhibit? Yes, it is. And 
Your Honor, I understand these are already admitted. I am still ask a few foundational questions just to establish knowledge. Very well, for the record. Uh, Detective, what do those, uh, what does states exhibit 11 and 14 and its sub parts? The photograph of that cemetery and photographs of Kylie as, as we took her out of the ground in her burial site. And were these photographs taken on June 9th and 10th? That's correct, yes. And were you were you on the scene that day when those photographs were taken? Yes. And are they true and accurate representations of what you saw? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, those exhibits having been admitted out as to publish the church. Uh, Detective, before I publish that, I'm going to place states exhibit ten A up again. And can you Point to the general location of what you've described as the pet cemetery. Right here. So, what can you have on the record? Can you explain where it's pointing? Yes. Yeah. Detective, will you explain where you're pointing? It's just east of this uh, shop area and just north of the fire pit. So, it's right through here. And Your Honor, I do think that the state's first picture under State's Exhibit 11 is, is okay for public consumption. It is. I just wanted to make sure our system was working as well, that Exhibit 11A is fine. Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 11A? <clears throat> this is where we began excavating briefly. Um, as you can see in this photograph, there's a small black dog statue next to the post. So that's where we had uh, learned this was the pet cemetery area through talking to the family members. And then there's just some tarps laid out for some of the soil. You can see in the back the markers that had been distinguished. Um, and laid out by ERT with a fire pit area that I had talked about earlier. And Your Honor, I think at this point it's appropriate to turn into public access. I agree. Detective, <clears throat> hey, um, you know, I'm at a bit of a. I have no idea if this is. I can't see if this. Well, I'll ask, Detective. Can you see that image in your monitor? Yes. Can you see most of it? Yes. Can you describe for the jury what's been marked in the state's exhibit 11B? What did you observe there? Can I see it? Um. Is there a way I can use the pointer? I have a suggestion also, Mr. Wood, just because I understand what you're doing to try to line that up since you can't see the monitor. Do you want to set um, a notepad or something on there to get it oriented that you could set on top of that just so that it's lined up? And if I could. Have the screen for one more. Thank you, Your Honor, for that suggestion. Okay. Um, 
Detective, what did you observe in State's Exhibit 11B? It's hard to describe that one, but I'll do the best. In the middle of that photograph, you can start to see the different color and the changes in the soil from dry to a wet, moist dirt. Um, you can start to see to the left just a little bit of that area. You can see the white piece sticking out and it's burnt on top and that's charred bone that's starting to stick out and all the little pieces next to it um, are, are pieces of burnt flesh, um, tissue, what we, we later uh, determined were organs that were all kind of, that's the top of what was inside the bucket. So that's what we first started to see when we started to execute. At this point, were you still using the hand tools? Oh, yes. Can you explain for the jury what, what you observed in State's Exhibit 11C? So as we started to excavate down further, some of the top of the mass of burnt flesh wasn't really attached to anything. And so when we would start to, to uh, dig away towards the sides, it, it would kind of come apart. It wasn't, it wasn't part of that original mass. And so what you're looking at on this blue tarp is burnt flesh still attached to some bone. The upper upper left part of that um, that section that you're looking at is part of the hip bone that still has burnt flesh attached to it and, and dirt and yeah, just fatty burnt tissue. You described the jury uh, what you observed in States Exhibit 11D. So when I talked about it started to take a roundish shape, this is what I'm referring to. And we dug around the sides of it, trying to get to the bottom. Because like I said, the goal was to, to get underneath, have three or four guys in there and just lift it onto the tarp. Um, so that's what you're looking at in this photograph is just the the uh, burnt flesh it's still just kind of inside that book. And judge, could we approach for a sidebar case? Yes. <laughs>
And that's part of the human school, just to the right of that, the green bucket. There were teeth there in the dirt as well. But that's what you're looking at, just a close up of the bottom of it. Can you explain for the jury what you observed in State's Exhibit 11 and a half? So once we, we removed uh, that mass and put it on the blue tarp, there was still some wet soil underneath. So we dug down even further to make sure that we had excavated everything we needed. And so what you're looking at, you can see the, the tarps in the background we had put up. Um, you can see the hand, some of the hand tools that we used just to the right of that pole. But that's what you're looking at is just after we got that mass out, the wet soil. Detective, what did you observe in states of 11G? So these were part of a tidy that kind of broke apart when we tried to lift it out of the ground. Um, there's pieces of charred bone. There's parts of a skull on the bottom left covered in dirt, and they're still burned rotting flesh still attached to the bone. So that's what you're looking at that one. These were the pieces that broke off. I believe you testified that you um, you assisted in transferring um, those remains to Madison County to the hospital, correct? Correct. I followed behind the corners. Um, was Lieutenant Ball with you again? He was. Once you got up to the hospital, what did you do? We observed the Fremont County Coroner bred to die transfer Tylee's remains into the morgue. The, the morgue was then locked, but there was evidence they put up. And at that point, uh, myself and Lieutenant Ball went back to the defendant, Davos residence. And, and what did you do when you got back there? We assisted and made sure there were no other burial sites or anything that the ERT team needed assistance with. At that point, we decided that we were going to uh, take JJ and Tylee to the Ada County Coroner's office um, to have an autopsy performed. So roughly four in the afternoon on Jan June 10th, 2020, <clears throat> it was decided that we were going to follow the county coroner with the remains of JJ and Tylee to the 80 County Coroner's Office for an autopsy the next morning. And when did you arrive in Ada County, approximately? Uh, approximately eight or nine in the evening on June 10th. And what did you do once you got there? We went directly to the coroner's office and JJ and Tylee were dropped off and the coroner's office took custody of both JJ and Tylee. Um, 
So that was late later in the evening. Correct. Uh, and uh, was an autopsy performed that night? No. When was the autopsy? The yeah, judge, I'm going to object. There needs to be some accommodation. Uh, overruled. If you know, you may answer. The autopsy was performed June 11th, uh, early morning hours. Well, that's, that was the next day. Correct. And were you were you present for that? Yes, I was. And where did that autopsy take place? At the Ada County Coroner's Office. So when you arrived at the coroner's office, what did you do first? Initially, when we arrived, uh, we had a little debrief with the medical examiner, Garth Warren. He told us what he judge, objection. It's grounds hearsay. Sustained. You met with Dr. Ward. Correct. What was the purpose of that meeting? To debrief us on what to expect that morning. Um, what did you do next? We went to the room where the autopsy was performed. We put the sanitary movies on our shoes, signed in on a whiteboard with our name and cell phone numbers. So we had a record of everybody that was in the room. And at that point, we stood back. Um, it's the, the wall and observed the autopsy. Now, as a detective, you don't perform an autopsy, correct? Correct. But you were able to see, uh, to see it take place. That's correct. Uh, and what did you observe happening during that autopsy? One of his team members brought out the uh, body bag. And I recognized it to be the same body bag that we took from defendant Daybell's backyard that day because it still had dirt on it. It still had the same lock. And at that point, they opened the body bag and revealed the same black plastic and small body that appeared to be in the black plastic. And, and then what did you observe? Dr. Warren and his team cut down the middle of the black plastic to open up what was inside. At that time, I observed a small child with duct tape on his head from his chin to his forehead area tightly wrapped around his head. He had red pajama pants on, red pajama shirt. He had his arms folded this way across his body. And it was duct tape from elbow all the way around to his other elbow. He had his ankles also bound with duct tape. He was still wearing um, his nighttime pull-up diaper. And he had black socks with the uh, word sketchers in orange. Um, I could tell that he was going through various states of decomposition based on the skin color. Judge, I'm going to object. Or else he doesn't have the experience to make a determination about the levels of decomposition. He's speculating. Sustain the objection and start the final part of the answer about the decomposition, Mr. Williams. All right. Detective, what did the body's skin look like? The, the skin was sloughing. It appeared to be bluish green, black, yellow. Um, and through my training experience, going through and handling different dead bodies at different stages of decomposition. That's what I read. Judge, I'm going to object again. There's been no foundation for him to make that sort of medical assessment. He's not a medical doctor. Your Honor, my argument would be that's not a medical assessment. It makes it on his training experience. 
I'll overrule the objection. If you'd like to cross further, you'll have a chance, Mr. Pryor. The objection is overruled. The foundation laid in the previous response. Detective, once, uh, <coughs> once this uh, the body was taken out of the bag, and you made the observations that you've just described. What happened next? Dr. Warren and his team then cut the the white plastic that was wrapped around his head and duct taped. They cut down the middle to reveal what was underneath. At that point, I observed another piece of duct tape stretched from JJ's jawline to jawline over his mouth. Um, he also cut the several layers of duct tape from his arms, and it revealed uh, some more duct tape that had his wrist bound underneath all those layers of duct tape. He then took his uh, bottom pajamas off and shirt, um, and it also revealed the nighttime pull-up diaper he was still wearing. Now, Detective, um, you spoke about the duct tape in the bag over, over the head, correct? Correct. And uh, you've been referring to this as JJ. Yes. Um, until that duct tape and bag were removed, though, were you able to identify him as JJ? No. Once they removed the duct tape in the bag, through looking at all the photographs for the last eight months of JJ, I recognized him to be the same little boy laying on that table as JJ Vallow. He had the same hairstyle, shorter on the sides, longer on top. Um, at that point, I recognized him as JJ. Uh, once the clothing was removed, what did you observe happened next? Uh, Dr. Warren pointed out some bruising um, on his arms, on his ankles, on his chest. He also pointed out some scratch marks on the left side of his neck, just under the duct tape. Um, at that point, um, Dr. Warren and his team performed the autopsy. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be shown on state's exhibits 12A through 12B. A through B. E. E. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Like the peer review of those exhibits, let me know when you had a chance to. Yeah. Do you recognize states exhibits 12A through E? Yes. What do they purport to be? JJ Bell laying on the table after they opened the black classic. And were you present when those pictures were taken? 
Yes, you were in the same room. Right. Uh, Uh, are those true and accurate representations of what you observed that day? Yes. Your Honor, I'd ask that states exhibits 12A through B entered into evidence. No objection, Judge. Very well. 12A through B are admitted. All of these are graphic in nature. Will not be uh, published or shelved on the court's live feed or to the public in the courtroom. They'll be published to the jurors, however, if you wish to split. Thank you. Detective, can you describe the jury what you observed in states exhibit 12A? Once they removed the black plastic that JJ Vallow was in, this is the first thing we saw. You can see on the white plastic on top of his head. That's the slit that was made um, when his head was sticking out of the ground. And you can see the duct tape I testified to wrapped around his entire face. His red pajamas are still soaked with body decomposition. Um, the level of duct tape on his arms is what really caught my attention. Um, and he still has the white, he has a white and blue child blanket wrapped around him. Can you describe the jury what you observed in states to the 12 b This is the JJ's legs, his bottom half, he has his red pajama pants on still. Uh, his ankles, like I testified, are wrapped with duct tape. Uh, those are his black sketcher socks that he had on. It's hard to see there too, but his, his legs, and, and body are also so in decomposition as well. Can you describe to the jury what you saw in states of the 12 c When I spoke earlier that Dr. Warren cut down the white plastic in the duct tape that was covering his head, this is what we saw. Um, you can see the other layer of duct tape around his mouth that went from jawline to jawline. You can see his hair, brown hair still is matted down to his head. Um, wet, so his body decomposition. But at that point, I was able to still recognize him as J.J. Vallow. You observed in 12D. That's the white bag that was covering his head. That looks like blood in the bag. It's actually body decomposition, just breaking down. Um, it appeared to be a normal trash bag. It had a red drawstring. And you can see, if you look close, it had the waffle style pattern, um, the expandable type. Trash bag. There's still pieces of duct tape that are attached. But that's what that photograph depicts. You described the material you saw in 12B. That's just another photo of JJ. The tape is starting to lose its stickiness because of the way the, the body is. Um, it's just a, a different photo or a different uh, angle of JJ's face.
Bit earlier than normal, but we are going to take a mid-morning recess at this time. We'll reach the meeting here about uh, quietly before 10 30 to get started with additional testimonies. All rise, please. <laughs> Gentlemen, if you are not part of the court staff, please enter the court.
Thank you. Please be seated. Council, if you're ready, we'll have the jurors brought back in. Thank you, Mr. Bailey. Please be seated. We're back on the record then on KCR 22211623, just included the morning recess. Uh, Detective Colonel CEO is still under oath. And Mr. Wood, if you'd like to continue with your direct, you can do that at this time. Thank you. I'm Detective, I think when we left off, we were speaking about the autopsy of J.D. Bell, correct? Correct. You had mentioned earlier that you did observe the, the actual, not only the body, but the autopsy of J.J. Bell. That's correct. And were you present for that entire autopsy? Yes, I was. And uh, when that autopsy was concluded, uh, what did you do? At that time, uh, Dr. Warren and his team removed JJ from that autopsy table. Then they then brought out a second, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, black body bag. And I recognized it to be the same body back from the scene because it also had dirt. And they placed that body back on the table. And what did you observe next? Dr. Warren and his team opened the body bag, um, looked at the remains for what was left as far as remains inside. Um, he stated there was nothing he could do at that time with an autopsy. So and then I'm going to move to strike as hearsay. Here on the statement already came through. Yeah. And I'm going to move to strike. So, <coughs> did you repeat the question? Uh, what did you observe? Uh, what were you, you had just talked about? The uh, Chinese remains being brought out. What did you observe? 
Um, once the remains were brought out, Dr. Warren opened the bag and looked at the remains and stated there was nothing he could do at that point. So at that time, uh, we left the autopsy room for the day. And when you left, did you do anything in furtherance of your investigation that day? No. Did you return to the DA County Coroner's office uh, the next day? We did on June 12th, um, 2020, we went back to the Ada County Coroner's office. Um, at that point, Lieutenant Wall took custody of some of the evidence and we transported it to the state lab in Meridian. And you were, were you with Lieutenant Wall when you did that? I was, yes. And once you took it to the state lab, what did you do? Uh, those items were ejected to the state lab. And then that concluded what we did for that day. Detective, you spoke earlier about some of the other agencies you've worked with in this investigation. And that is, is it correct you work with Fremont County? Correct, yes. And I, I believe you testified that your primary focus in this investigation was looking for Tyler and JJ. Is that accurate? Yes, that's accurate. Uh, was there a, an investigation in Fremont County at the same time that uh, had connections to your investigation? Yes, there was. What was that investigation? Fremont was investigating the death of Tammy Daybell, uh, who was married to the defendant, Chad Daybell, kind of the exact same time we were doing our investigation with missing children. Right. And would you uh, meet with Fremont County and discuss the cases together? Yes, we would. And would you, would you aid each other in those investigations? Yes. Would you share information? Yes. Detective, were you, are you aware of any event involving Tammy Daybell on October 9th, 2019? Yes, I am. I, how did you become aware of that event? Through the course of sharing information with the Fremont County Sheriff's Office, we were advised. Judge, uh, can we approach? Yes. <clears throat> I want to have the court reporter, if we could read back Mr. Wood's previous question before the sidebar, and then I'll see if there's an objection held by defense. Question, how did you become aware of that event? Is there an objection to that, Mr. Pryor? No, not to that question. Okay, then Mr. Wood, just proceed with another question. I don't think the there's no objection to the question. I don't think it's answered yet. Okay. You can answer. We were uh, advised through the course of our investigation that 
Judge, I'm going to object at this point. The question is whether he was advised, not what he was advised of, but whether he was advised. Our response, Mr. Wood? I'm not quite sure I understand the objection, Your Honor. Uh, I don't as well, so you can continue with your response. <laughs> can you repeat the question, please? Uh, how did you become aware of the events of October 9th, 2019? Through the course of our investigation, we were aware of those events through speaking with three more county sheriff's office. Uh, why was it important to, to you in investigating your case to share information and receive information with three more county? It was important because the um, suspects in that case were the exact same suspects in our case. And so we wanted to make sure that we shared information so nothing was missed. At that point, we were still looking for two small children. And so it was imperative to us that we shared information and gathered information from neighboring counties and anybody that, that was involved with this case. And did you also uh, confer with Arizona law enforcement? We did, yes. Detective, are you aware of who Charles Vallow was? Yes. Who was he? Charles Vallow was married to Lori Vallow. Great. Is he alive? No, he is not. Do you know when he died? Charles died July 11th, 2019. Are you aware of how he died? Charles was shot by Alex Cox, Lori's brother. Now, you testified earlier that your initial involvement in this case uh, involved looking for a Jeep. That's correct. And I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe you testified that you were looking for that Jeep because it was requested by Arizona law enforcement. That's correct, yes. Okay. And are you aware of why they were looking for that Jeep? Yes, I am. Why were they looking for that Jeep? That Jeep was a suspect in an attempted homicide of Brandon Boudreau, who was Lori's, who was married to Lori's niece, Melanie Boudreau. The suspect in that homicide was also Alex Cox. Detective. Going back to October 9th, 2019 in Tammy Davo, are you aware um, of the incident that took place with Tammy Davo? Yes, I am. What was it? Judge, I'm going to object. There's no foundation as to how he became aware of it. Sustained. Through your investigation, did you become aware of what happened with Tammy Davo? Yes, I did. And how did you become aware of that information? Sharing information with Fremont County. And that, so was this part of the collective knowledge of the case that you were working on? That's correct, yes. And did you did you aid in that investigation as well? I did. So you personally became aware of these events? Correct. Uh, based, based on your knowledge and your investigation, are you aware of any event involving Tammy Daybell on October 9th, 2018? Judge, again, there hasn't been proper foundation. I think at this point I've established that it's through his investigation and not the humor. This objection is overruled. You can answer the question. Yes, I'm aware. And what was that event? On October 9th, 2019, Tammy Daybell believes that she was shot at in the driveway of the defendant Daybell's residence. And are you, when you say shot at, did she, are you aware of what she, how she thought she was shot at? She initially reported that it was a, possibly a paintball gun.
Detective, in in your investigation, did you ever put together timelines of events that took place? Yes, I did. Why is it important to do that? Just to establish who uh, the key figures were, the key dates to aid in our investigation, so we can make sure that we share the accurate and correct information with the other agencies. And in preparing for this trial, did you prepare any charts of key figures to aid the jury in understanding your testimony and the testimony of the trial? Yes, I did. And was that based on your involvement in the case? Yes. And your investigation? Correct. And uh, and based on information, I'm, I'm sorry, that wasn't very well said, based on the information you gained from your investigation? That's correct. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed States Exhibit 30. Detective, do you have states exhibit 30 in your hand? Yes, I do. What does it report to be? Those are the key figures that I put together as far as the investigation goes, photographs. And did you do that to aid this jury in understanding who the people involved in this case are? Yes. And you, did you do that in anticipation of your testimony? Yes, I did. Right. And are those, the, the pictures attached with those names, can you are those true and accurate representations of those of the individuals attached to those names? Yes, they are. Your Honor, for demonstrative purposes only, the state would move to enter State's Exhibit 30 into evidence. Any objection? For demonstrative purposes, no. Very well. Exhibit 30 is marked for that reason. <clears throat> May I publish? Yes. <clears throat> If you, can, if you can just use your pointer and just, for purposes of the record, read the names attached with each picture. Sure. This is Lori Vallow Dayville, Charles Vallow, Alex Cox, who is Lori's brother, Chad Dayville, Tammy Dayville, his deceased wife, Tylee Ryan, who is a uh, daughter to Lori. J.J. Vallow was a son to Lori, and Melanie Kalowski Boudreau, she was remarried, is the niece to Lori Vallow. Now, when you say that uh, J.J. was Lori Vallow, they both son, was he also Charles Vallow's son? Yes, he was. And that was by way of adoption, correct? That's correct. And so Alex Cox was J.J. and Tylee's uncle? Yes. <laughs> Detective, similar to that last chart, did you prepare a timeline in anticipation of your testimony? Yes, I did. And did you do that based on your experience and knowledge of the case? Yes, I did. And it was based on information you gained through your investigation? That's correct. And did you do that to aid the jurors in understanding just the basic timeline of, of the events that happened in this case? Yes. Your Honor, I'd ask the witness of the United States Exhibit 31.
Judge, could we approach please with sidebar? Yes.
this time, ladies and gentlemen, the jury, there's an evidentiary issue to resolve, which we are going to take up outside of the presence of the jury. We'll do that as quickly as we can. So uh, I will be off the bench while I research this momentarily, then we'll come back on and make a ruling outside of the jury's presence, bring them back in and continue evidence. All rise, please. <laughs> Maybe see them.
Thank you. Please be seated. All right, we are back on the record on CR 2221-1623. We are going to take up the objection outside of the presence of the jury as it relates to the state's proposed exhibit, in this case, particularly state's proposed exhibit 31. And the court uh, had to go back and review some prior rulings in the case that occurred some time ago. Uh, I've done that now. So the what I'd like to go through is the proffer and determination if there's still a objection to the exhibit and make a ruling on that outside of the jury's presence. So Mr. Wood has offered exhibit 31, which is a timeline. And Mr. Pryor, does the defense maintain an objection to the admission of that timeline? Judge, I spoke with Mr. Lake. I spoke with Ms. Blake, and procedurally, I think at the time that the 404B was filed by the state, we were also dealing with the severance issue, is what I recall. And then she discussed that with me. So I think I may have made a, a, a non-objection to the 404B. And I think I made a record of that uh, when Mr. Thomas and Mr. Archibald were, uh, uh, were objecting to that. So I, I may have, I may for, forego my objection because I think um, my recollection is I didn't, I don't have a record of it yet, which is a little unusual, but uh, I think I may have uh, noted on the record to the court that I'm not objecting to the introduction of the 404B evidence. All right. I understand. I think there was lodged an objection back February 14th of 2023 by you to the 404B motion. Does the state have any clarification on that, Mr. Wood? Your Honor. Your Honor, just based on recollection, I believe there was, there were, it was a, not an objection to all of the states intended for or be some of it. And I, my recollection, and I'm not looking at any document, this is just my recollection, uh, was that uh, the defendant did stipulate to some of the 404B, uh, including uh, issues dealing with Charles Ballow and Brandon Boudreau. And that's my recollection. And Judge, my recollection is that I did file a timely objection, but then at the hearing, there was, and, and I'm going back, Judge, and we're talking three or two, three years ago, um, and I'm just going off of recollection as well, as Mr. Wood is. I believe that I filed an objection, and then at the time of the hearing, I may have orally stated that I'm not objecting to the introduction of the Brandon Boudreaux or the uh, Charles Fallow information. And Mr. Thomas and Mr. Archibald continued theirs, and the hearing was continued on. And somewhere in the interim, Judge, uh, there was a severance order granted. And I don't know whether I was part of the 404B motion. That's where I'm having some difficulty in recollection. And my records don't show an order that you granted the 404B in this case. So I don't see an order in this case. Okay. Um, so just to clarify, there was an objection was filed on behalf of Mr. Davo by Mr. Pryor, February 14th, 2023 to the 404B. We then had a hearing on the 404B evidence on February 22nd, 2023, the court then issued an oral ruling on the record. And in that oral ruling went through uh, different evidence that was sought to be proffered under 404B. And among the rulings the court made on the court minutes under paragraph nine, specifically referencing consideration of the shooting at Mr. Boudreaux the court weighed out the 404B arguments and found that it would be admissible at trial. And then uh, in the hearing, I did indicate that I'd gone through the 
analysis for 404 be looking at uh, the, the state versus Fox case, doing a two-tiered weighing with the factors, balancing them out with the evidence proffered, um, and ultimately, uh, and I'm looking at the transcript of this hearing where I made the oral ruling, determining finally, uh, quote, the court does find there is relevance under tier one, parts one and two for the introduction of that evidence. And then I looked at rule 403 to see if the uh, there was probative value to substantially outweigh the danger of unfair prejudice. And finally determined that as to the attempted shooting of Brandon Boudreaux, there would be more probative than unfairly prejudicial as it would relate back to the purported plan of the defendants. So the court did find that the state was permitted to introduce that 404B evidence. So as we stand here, uh, knowing procedurally that's the ruling on the timeline, I guess I'll first come back to this proposed Exhibit 31 and ask if there's any objection at this point for the defense, Mr. Pryor. No, Judge. Okay. So. Exhibit 31 then has been offered and will be admitted. Um, I would also note on the record that I think the door has been open to discuss that anyway, based on opening argument as well. But for that reason, and also based on the court's prior determination made, uh, I am going to permit that reference on 404B evidence. Um, the reason I'm still discussing this for counsel is I think this now uh, triggers a requirement that I give a limiting instruction to the jurors about how 404B evidence is considered, and I do have to prepare a limiting instruction that uh, I am going to advise them of at such point as after your exhibit's been offered, Mr. Wood. Okay. Okay. Thanks for the delay there. If we could bring the jurors back in, please. This is, I don't know where the, I've got the actual exhibit. <laughs> and Judge, if I could just quickly inquire before the jury comes back in, if the court did have both pages of that, and it's, I don't, I only have a uh, first page. Okay, I, once we get done with this one, I'll bring that up. Okay. Uh, jury present and count for. All right, thank you. Please be seated. All right, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, apologies for that delay. We were working through an evidence issue. I will note that the state has offered Exhibit 31, which has now been admitted by the court. It's a timeline. It does make some references in there that uh, for me at this time, I think would be best to give the jurors a special limiting instruction. So I'll read this instruction to the jurors at this time. 
Ladies and gentlemen, during the course of this trial, evidence will be introduced for the purpose of showing that the defendant committed acts other than for which the defendant is on trial. Such evidence, if believed, is not to be considered by you to prove the defendant's character or that the defendant has a disposition to commit crimes. Rather, such evidence may be considered by you only for the limited purpose of proving the defendant's motive, opportunity, intent, plan, or absence of mistake or accident. So that instruction provided, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to proceed with that exhibit you missed. Yeah, I don't have an exhibit. Well, I believe the uh, witness does. May I publish? Yes. Uh, just briefly before I do, uh, Detective, we, before we took a break, we spoke about uh, timeline you prepared. Great. And the reason you prepared that was to aid the jury in understanding the events of this case. Yes. If you can, thank you. If you can take your pointer and uh, and go through these events and just read them into the record. July 11, 2019, Charles Vallow dies. September 2nd through September 3rd, 2019, Rory Alex. And the kids, JJ and Tally, moved to Rexburg, Idaho. The last known proof of life for Tylee was September 8, 2019. The last known proof of life for JJ was September 22, 2019. The attempted shooting at Brandon Boudreau, Gilbert, Arizona, or attempted homicide, excuse me, October 2, 2019. The attempted shooting of Tammy Daybell, October 9th, 2019. The death of Tammy Daybell, October 19th, 2019. Can you on the second page? November 1st, police receive a call about a Jeep. The Jeep is located November 4th, 2019. Chad and Lori get married in Kauai, November 5th, 2019. Welfare check on JJ, November 26th, 2019, which is the same day Alex and Chad were contacted. The Richburg Police Department searched Lori and Alex's apartments November 27th, 2019. Search warrant served on the Daybell residence was June 9th on 2020. JJ and Tyler were taken to the Ada County Coroner's office June 10th, 2020. And the autopsy was conducted June 11th of 2020. Thank you. Your Honor, I have no further questions for this witness at this time. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Pryor, cross-examination. Would the like, judge, would the court like me to start, or would you or like to take a break at the lunch break? Uh, let's go ahead and get started with cross and go till it was then, please. Okay. Good afternoon, Good morning, officer. Good morning, sir. We do know each other. We've at least exchanged pleasantries a couple of times. Yes, sir. In the past. Uh, and I guess for purposes of this hearing, would you prefer that I refer to you as lieutenant or officer? Lieutenant's fine. 
Mr. Pryor, I apologize very much for the interruption. I wanted to confirm something on that last exhibit. It was entered by the court. Is that a demonstrative exhibit? That's what I understood. Either as a demonstrative or a summary. Okay, thank you, Council. Apologies for the interruption. Judge, I'm also looking for the note. Oh, I found it. So, Lieutenant, um, you've been involved in a number of aspects in regards to this case, right? That's correct. You've done some investigation on your own in terms of uh, the welfare check with Lori Vallon, is that right? Yes. Uh, but you've also interviewed a number of witnesses, is that correct? Yes. You interviewed Melanie again, David Warwick, right? Yes. Several times? A few times. Okay. And you've interviewed a number of other witnesses as it relates to this case. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, now you previously discussed um, uh, your role as a uh, police officer and investigator in this case. And I guess I want to clarify something if you could, please. Um, as a police officer investigating a case, your role is to conduct an investigation, right? Look at the facts. Correct. Right. Try to establish and get some gain some information, right? Right. But you're not supposed to judge one way or the other, right? You're supposed to remain neutral. That's correct. And you're not supposed to narrow that role as a police officer to a particular person. Is that correct? That's correct. In other words, you're supposed to look at the evidence as a whole. And rather than focusing on one person and saying, we're going to assume this person did this, and we're going to build our case around prosecuting that person. That would be inappropriate, wouldn't it? Right. Your role is actually to look at all the evidence, consider all the evidence. And once you've gathered all the evidence that you think is relevant to a case, what do you do with that evidence? We follow the evidence. Okay. And then once you follow the evidence, and you, you've established a report or a, you know, you've come to a, concluding your investigation, what do you do with that evidence that you concluded with? We put a case together. Okay, and then do you provide it to someone? We provide it to the prosecutors. Okay, so there's distinct roles as part of a uh, criminal case. You'd agree with that, right? Yes. And your role is to conduct an investigation, correct? Correct. correct. Look into all possible evidence of any kind, correct? That's correct. And view the evidence, right? Yes not make any determination as to what that evidence means, but rather gather as much evidence as you think is relevant in your mind to put together a compilation of that evidence, correct? Correct. Okay. And then at that point, only at that point, do you provide it to the prosecuting attorney and they make a determination as to whether or not uh, they will pursue charges against somebody. Do you understand? Is that the way you understand the process is supposed to work? Yes. Okay. And if you were not to follow that process, if you were not to follow what I just described, that wouldn't be appropriate. There's, there's protocols. Do you agree with that, right? Yes. Okay. And you should never um, blend the roles of a police officer with the role of a, private, with the role of a uh, prosecuting attorney. You would agree with that, right? Explain what you mean by blend the roles. Well, I mean, uh, it's not a prosecutor's role to show up at an, at an investigation when you're conducting an investigation and engage in part of the process of an interview with witnesses. You'd agree with that, right? I've had prosecutors show up to certain investigations. Okay, but that's not the norm, is it? Um, I, I think it depends on the investigation. Okay, okay. So in other words, uh, you think that it's appropriate that if a prosecutor is, is uh, deciding whether to, for, to pursue charges against somebody, that they should also participate in the interviewing of these witnesses as part of that process. Is that what you're telling me? I think it's important to, for a prosecutor to have all the information. Well, doesn't that create a problem in your mind? No, sir. Okay. Well, let me talk to you a little bit about that. 
Because if you're doing an investigation and you're really remaining neutral as part of that investigation, right? You're not supposed to make judgments, correct? Correct. You're supposed to look at the evidence, gather all the evidence, and then make a determination of what evidence you want to submit to a prosecuting attorney, right? Correct. Do you ever get involved in um, the process of deciding whether someone should be charged or not? What, what do you mean by that, sir? Well, after the evidence is all gathered, and after you've done your report as a police officer and put together all of the information, do you ever go over to the prosecutor's office and say, you know what, I put this evidence together, and you know what, uh, I want to have a discussion with you about whether or not we want to charge this person. That wouldn't be appropriate, would it? I'm going to object as argumentative. So Okay. But would it be appropriate for a prosecutor to interview witnesses and inject their personal opinion in those uh, in those processes of interviewing witnesses. Would that be proper under any circumstances? Yeah, I'm going to object as argumentative. I'll overrule that objection. And could you repeat the question again? Yes. Uh, but would it be appropriate for a prosecutor to interview witnesses and inject their personal opinion in those in those processes? of interviewing witnesses, would that be proper under the circumstances? To interject their personal opinion? Yeah. I would say probably not. Okay. So if you're engaging in name calling or, or making references to a person's character uh, in a case, that would clearly be an inappropriate act, would it not? The objection would be on the scope, Your Honor. That's the same. And that's facts, not evidence. Go ahead. Sure. Now, um, you spoke a little bit about this body cam issue. And um, you said that it was a policy that there's only one body cam among seven or ten of you as detectives. Is that right? No, sir. I never once said it was policy. I just said there was only one body cam. Oh, so it's seven detectives. So, in other words, you share a body cam. It's not a policy within the department. Right. Okay, is there, is there a policy in the department about recording or, or trying to preserve a record when you're interviewing witnesses? Yes. Okay, what's that policy, sir? When we interview and conduct interviews at the police department? Yeah. Those interviews are recorded. Okay. Now, what about if you're out in the field and you're conducting an, an interview? Is that to be recorded as well? There's no policy that says it has to be recorded. Okay. Do you carry a microphone as well, officer, other than a body cam? No, not on my person, I don't. Okay, do you carry a cell phone while you're doing that that's issued by the county? Do I keep the cell phone in my car? Yes. I didn't ask you that. I said, do you carry a cell phone when you go out in the field? On my person or in my vehicle? Either one. In my vehicle. Okay. And does that cell phone have the technology that allows you to, to record or photograph uh, and, and videotape images? Yes, it does. Okay. So what I understand is on November 26, 2019, you were um, directed or you directed your folks to go out to the Lori Vallo residence. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. And you said that you were with a couple of you were with um, Ron Ball. Is that who you said you were with? At, at one time, yes, I was with a couple of different officers that day. Oh, so tell me who you were with on, the, on that day. Mind me. Detective Dave Holt. Okay. Detective David Stubbs. Okay. And Lieutenant Ron Ball. So there were four of you who went out there to uh, to locate or to find out some information about what again? Remind me. About the whereabouts of J.J. Bell. Okay. And this was a, a concern that you uh, um, had because you were contacted by an, another law enforcement agency expressing concern about the safety of a young child, right? No, sir. Okay, tell me what was the purpose? It was a simple effort, welfare check. Okay. And you went out on this welfare check and there were, if, if my map is correct, please correct me. Uh, did all four of you detectives and, and lieutenants go out at the same time? No, sir. You went out at different times? Myself and Dave Hope went out initially. Okay, and then when did the other two uh, officers show up? When I called them based on the lies that I had been told. Okay. And these lies that you've been told, 
Um, at that point, you and Detective Hope, neither of you decided to bring a video camera, right? That's correct. And neither of you decided to wear a recorder to record any of the uh, incidents that took place about these so-called lies, right? That's correct. And nobody took out their phone and recorded it or made a video or audio recording of the discussion with Mr. Daybell or Mr. Cox on November 26, 2019, right? Let's hear it. And even after you said these so-called lies, even after you discovered that, uh, you know, Mr. Daybell apparently told you something that you didn't think was true, at that point, did you instruct any of the uh, officers who were coming to aid you? Maybe it's a good idea we should bring an audio with, uh, or a video camera with us or a, a mic to record some of these statements because I have some concerns. Did you think about that? Right. We did that, sir. Hold on. Okay. I don't know that there was an objection and sustaining the objection. So uh, strike the answer. You can ask another question, Mr. Pryor. And it was uh, Detective Stubbs who had the video cam, is that right? That's correct, sir. Okay. And that was when you video cam Miss Vallow about when you had contact eventually with Miss Vallow. Is that what the video? Uh, camera that you're talking about? I didn't have contact with, with Ms. Vallo. Now, um, I'm, I'm a little confused about something. Uh, and maybe you can clear this up. You said that um, you asked Mr. Daybell first about whether he had Lori Vallo's phone number, correct? No, sir. I didn't contact Mr. Daywheel until after I contacted Alex Cox. Okay. At some point, did you ask for Lori Vallow's phone number for Mr. Daywheel? Yes, I did. Okay. And at no point did you ever make a threat to him saying you're going to turn this phone number over to us, right? No, sir. At no point did any other officer walk up to him and say, if you don't turn this phone number over, you're uh, going to get yourself in a lot of trouble. That never took place to your knowledge, right? That's good. Okay. But then after that, you're saying, at first he said, I'm not going to give you the phone number. And then out of the blue, he decides to give you the phone number. Object. Objection that states the facts and evidence. Okay. Then subsequent to that, he's well, like, Mr. Pryor, when there's an objection, I'm going to rule on it before you launch into another question. So the objection is sustained. Subsequent to that, he decides to give you the phone number. Is that right? Can you repeat the question, please? I'll go back over the... Uh, the analysis here. Thank you. Okay. If your your testimony is that Mr. Daybell refused to give you the phone number at first, correct? That's correct. And he and that was an adamant refusal. He said, "No, I don't know uh, what her phone number is." Right? That's correct. And then, without any further prompting by the police officers or any encouragement by law enforcement, he shows back up and gives you the phone number later. Right? Objection. He's misstating the facts of the well, evidence. I'm, I'm trying to establish the facts, Judge. The objection is overruled. If the witness has an answer, you may answer. You say he showed back up. He never left when I originally asked him. Okay. I had to ask him twice to get the phone number. Okay. And how much time passed between the first request and the second request? Roughly a minute. Okay. So without any prompting by the police, he... He, um, he asked him for the phone number, he denied, and then within 60 seconds, he said, oh, here's the phone number. Is that what your testimony is? When Detective Hope started walking towards us and I re-asked him again, that's when he gave me the number. So you had to ask him twice, is that what you're saying? That's correct. Now you, um, I'm going to kind of bounce around a little bit, okay? Please, please bear with me, okay? Um, you made a, a comment about supposed paintball guns, and then if I misquote your testimony, please correct me, okay? You said something about a supposed paintball gun incident with um, Tammy Daybell, right? Yes. Okay. And um, then you later on decided that it was a 
the words you used were a shooting. Is that the words you used? Probably. Well, you were just here testifying a few minutes ago and just used the word shooting when Mr. Wood talked to you about that, right? Uh, yes. Okay. Now, as part of your investigation, um, you got a chance to look at all the evidence, right? In this case, you got access to almost all the evidence in this case. Right? That's right. And have you gone through all the evidence in this case? Yes, I have. Okay. And did you look um, at evidence of, uh, of facts and circumstances surrounding the Tammy Daybell incident on October 9th? Uh, yes. Okay. And Judge, just bear with me. Your Honor, if he's going to be showing evidence digitally, can we put our screen back up? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure I'm going to be up there, but I'll help them. Now, I would uh, represent to you that um, we previously uh, stipulated to the admission of a number of exhibits in this case. And one of the exhibits is exhibit number 16. Okay? And the parties that previously exhibited, Judge, um, I'm going to, well, I've already, we've already looked at this already been exhibited. So what, what I'm going to do is show you exhibit 16. Okay? And this is what I already admitted. It's already been admitted, Judge, previously. Now, you talked about um, facts, and you used the word shooting is what you used, right? With Terry Daybell? Right. And you don't believe that uh, Terry Daybell was shot at with anything other than a paintball gun, do you? Objection relevance. Or you don't believe that Terry Daybell was shot with anything other than a paintball gun, do you? Yes, I do, sir. Okay, and what do you base that on? The evidence. Um, through our investigation. Okay. And part of your investigation is you, uh, did you look at the Tammy Daybell uh, evidence that she provided to your office? To my office or Fremont County? Fremont County. I did. Okay. And one of the pieces of evidence is exhibit number 16. Judge, I don't see it going up. All right, Council, if you'd like, we can take a motion break, or we can keep moving on here for a minute. Here we are, Judge. <clears throat> okay. Okay, and officer, I'd have you turn to the screen and see if you can read the screen. Just read it. Not out loud, just to yourself. Let me know when you're done. I'm done, sir. Okay. And I would represent to you that this is a uh, email from Tammy Daybell to her friends in the Salem Third Ward of her church. Okay. And would you would you start with the word something and read the email to me? Something really weird just happened. I want you to know so you can watch out. I'd gotten home and parked in our in our front driveway. As I was getting stuff out of the back seat, a guy wearing a ski mask suddenly standing at the back of my car with a paintball gun. He shot at me several times, although I don't think it was loaded. I yelled for Chad and he ran around the back of the house. I have no idea what his motive was and he never spoke, even after I asked him several times what he, though. Okay. So, and do you see the date on this email? <clears throat> It's no. just about friends there. Are we going to object to this being characterized as an email? I'll sustain that. Okay. Do you want to clarify, Mr. Fire, what type of communication it is? Well, it's a communication to the friends of the church, and I think it's a text I'm message. I'm sorry. I can. I believe it's a text message. Judge, I may have misstated that it was an email. Okay. My apologies. 
So this text message went out to all of the friends of the third Salem Third Ward. It's an LDS ward over in the town of Salem, right? I can't answer that. I don't know. You know where the town of Salem is, right? I do. And that's a town that's uh, close to Rexburg? Correct. Okay. And obviously, the, you can't answer that about the ward or anything like that, but obviously the term ward would suggest that it's some sort of a religious <laughs> group of folks they're talking to, right? Correct. Okay. But this email doesn't say that she was shot with a gun. But there's even a mention of the gun. The email talks about a paintball. Again, yeah, I'm going to object to the characterization, characterization of this as an email. It's going to be. I'm sorry. What's the question? Yeah. When there's an objection, let's try again. Got to have time to get it on the record, make a ruling, and then respond to it. So sustain the steps, the evidence. Text. I'm also going to object to this being described as a text message. There needs to be some foundation for what this evidence actually is. Judge, I don't need a foundation. This has been admitted as an exhibit. This All is right. admitted. I'll overrule that objection. The jury could do it in the format it came in with the uh, screen capture. Okay. So, in any way, this message from Ms. Daybell to the people of the third ward doesn't say that it was a gun, does it? Does, does it say it's a gun? It just says it's a paintball gun. Oh, it says it's a paintball gun. You're right. Okay, it doesn't say any other gun, though, right? If there's any confusion about that, right? Not in this email or text. Okay. Did you also have an occasion to look at the, um, I'll be bringing that up later, but the, uh, uh, the search engine from Tammy Daybell's account? No, I did not look at the search engine for Tammy's. Did you, were you aware that, uh, um, and I, I'm going to hack his name, but one of the officers, Officer K, he, he, Whatever his name is, Officer K was provided uh, email uh, search search information that Tammy Daniel engaged in um, regarding paintball guns in a picture. Are you aware of that? Uh, objection calls for speculation. I'm asking whether he's aware of it. Overall, are you aware of it? I was aware that they were, he was provided information. I can't tell you exactly what the information he was. Okay, we'll we'll get to that in another day. But did you also listen to the 911 call that was made regarding the paintball incident? I did. Okay. And there was no mention of a gun in that 911 call, right? No. The, the mention in the 911 call is that someone took a shot at me or tried to take a shot with a paintball gun, right? That's correct. Okay. So the suggestion today that uh, um, it was a gun is based on your own hunch, right? No, sir. Well, do you have the gun? I have evidence of Google searches done by Alex Cox around right. that time. Okay. Do you have information as to where Alex Cox was at the time of this alleged shooting? Yes, sir. You do have evidence of that? He was at the Daybell residence earlier that day. I didn't ask you on the day of uh, the Daybell residence at the time of this shooting. And do you recall when this shooting took place? I believe it was maybe eight in the evening, maybe. Right. And 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 let's clarify this because the, the data that you have regarding him being at the residence was much earlier in the day, right? That's correct. And he and, and you don't have any data that shows that Alex Cox's phone dinged or any other communication device that Alex Cox had was at the location of the house at the time of this paintball incident, do you? At the time, no, sir. Okay. And uh, so at this point, the information you're talking about is there's some Google searches by Alex Cox, correct? That's correct. And the information is that you've decided to um, not take into consideration Tammy Daniels' own statement about a paintball gun? Objection restates his testimony. Sustained. So what other information are you, are, you, are you leaning on to suggest that this was anything but a paintball gun? The Google searches performed by Alex Cox talked about shooting through uh, Dodge Dakota. Okay, and I, I appreciate that. And, and um, that would be one of Chad and, and Tammy Daniels' vehicles, is that correct? That's correct. Okay, were you aware of who was driving the Dodge Dakota at the time that incident took place? No, sir. Okay. 
Uh, did you talk to any of the family members, any of the four children about who was actually the driver of this Dodge Dakota that was that Alex Cox was trying to figure out a way to shoot through? We attempted to contact those children and they wouldn't speak with us. Okay. Okay, so you don't know whether Chad Daybell or Tammy Daybell were driving that Dodge Dakota, right? That's correct. So the reality is that um, Tammy Daybell was driving the Dodge Dakota. It sounds like Alex Cox had something for Tammy Daybell. Is that what you're suggesting? I'm not suggesting that. I'm just simply stating what Mr. Cox's Google searches were around the time of that shooting. Okay, and you're basing those those Google searches on your position that you believe this was a shooting, right? That's correct. Okay, so if Chad Daybell was driving the Dodge Dakota during this time, and he was the primary driver and maybe the only driver, would that mean that you would be looking at whether Alex Cox was trying to shoot Chad Daybell? Chad Daybell didn't call in a 911 call and said he was shot at Tammy Daybell. Yeah, but Tammy Daybell called in a 911 call about a paintball gun. And it was a paintball gun. And we'll let Officer uh, 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 Cannon talk about that. And we'll listen to the 911 call. Mr. Jackson, that's not a question. Well, the question is, Mr. Pryor, again, you've got to give me an opportunity to roll an objection that is sustained. It's just argument. It's not a question. You can ask another question. The shooting and the call that's taking place was in reference to a paintball gun incident, wasn't it? Can you repeat the question, sir? I couldn't hear you. The call that was made regarding this incident was a 911 call about a paintball incident, wasn't it? They used the words paintball in the 911 call. Didn't they? That's correct. We'll move on. Okay. Now, we previously talked about, and Judge, I don't know when you want to stop. I've got a ways to go. I, I think this probably is a good time to go lunch break, even the time. So we will take our lunch uh, recess. That will be an hour. We'll plan on coming back on for additional testimony around 10 and a quarter after one. All rise, please.
And hey, welcome back to Law and Crime, everybody. Thanks for joining us. So we are still in the Idaho trial for defendant Chad Daybell, the self-proclaimed prophet turned accused murderer. But right now, the jury is on their lunch break. So that means we're going to be doing our live Q&A here on the network. This is where you submit your questions on social media like YouTube, Twitter, X, Facebook. And my guests and I are going to be answering all those questions the best way that we can. But before we even go into the q and I want to give you a little bit more background about this case. Remember, Chad Daybell is the 55-year-old defendant who faces three counts of first-degree murder for the 2019 deaths of Tammy Daybell, Tylee Ryan, and Joshua J.J. Vallow. Now, Tammy, Chad's wife at the time, died in October of 2019 of what was later found to be asphyxiation or suffocation. As for Tylee and JJ, the children of the defendant's current wife and co-defendant, Lori Bella Daybell, they were just 16 and 7, respectively, in September of 2019 when they went missing. And the remains were found buried in the defendant's backyard in June of 2020. Now, the children's mother, Lori, she was convicted and sentenced to life in prison almost a year ago now for her role in her children's deaths, among other charges. Chad and Lori appear to have been convinced that the End of times were approaching and the dark spirits were taking over the souls of various people in their lives. They reportedly believed that these dark spirits were turning people into zombies and that those people needed to be eliminated or killed. That's just a wild, wild roller coaster of a story. But Daybell's trial is expected to last up to 10 weeks. Long Crime is going to be covering every second of it, so you're going to want to stay here for our coverage. But right now, let's talk about our Q&A. With me to talk about it is Terry Austin and host of Pretty Lies and Alibis, the podcast, Gigi McKelvey. Great to have you both back here. Okay, let's start it off. We got a question from Bonkers from YouTube. Gigi, I'll start it with you. What is the effect of the prosecution starting their case with the detective in Chad's trial, meaning uh, Ray Hermosillo, because the prosecution in Lori's trial started first with Kay Woodcock, JJ's grandmother. Is this an effective change in strategy? Gigi, what do you make of it? I think maybe, you know, with the prosecution having a year to sort of go back and fine tune the way they presented Lori's case, maybe they saw that this testimony was more effective with the jury. It's powerful. It's why we're here finding those kids' bodies and finding out what happened. So maybe they're just going in fast and furious and putting out the worst part to make that first impression. That's kind of what I think. Um, Kay, Kay's testimony is is crucial to establishing the search for the kids beginning with that um, welfare check. But I think going in with Detective Ray Hermosillo is smart because you're just, it's kind of that shock value of what was found that day and in what condition. So Terry, we have a lot, by the way, I'll, Terry, you can answer that point, but look, I, I think that if you have a winning strategy from the prosecution, why change things up if you want to address that? But I have a lot of questions right now from a lot of different people asking the same thing. Grizz mom from YouTube. What's Pryor trying to do with this line of questioning, meaning the way he's cross-examining Detective Ray Hermosillo? This is also from Yvonne Wilhouse on YouTube. Uh, was there any point to that cross at all? Walk us through it. You know, the problem here is Pryor doesn't have a lot to attack. So one of the first things you see a defense attorney doing is attacking the investigation. And I think the reason that the detective is on the stand first here, it's a very little change up. I mean, he was the third witness, now he's the first witness. He's outlining the dates, he's doing the timeline. Then I think they'll probably call Kay to talk about when she started thinking about the missing of JJ. So I think it makes sense. But what Pryor is doing is trying to say, look, you came into this with a foregone conclusion. You weren't just investigating. You were supposed to gather all the evidence, then give it to the prosecution for them to determine whether or not this individual committed a crime. And instead what you did, or at least this is what Pryor is claiming, you came to a conclusion and, and you followed that instead of following the facts. It's a tactic. It's a tactic for sure. Uh, we go to Joe Simpson on YouTube. This is for you, Gigi. High long crime. Ask Gigi if she thinks Pryor's tactics are effective. No, I think they're going to very quickly grate on the nerves of this jury. And I saw it last year. You know, in Lori's trial, the defense was very reserved due to the fact that she set very strict parameters of what they couldn't do. But there were times where the uh, cross exam did get a little forceful. And juries don't appreciate that. It makes everybody in the room feel uncomfortable. I think the jury is going to be sympathizing with Detective Hermosillo. Uh, last year's facial expressions, you could tell the man is devastated at what he found. 
And for John Pryor to be attacking him, I just don't think it's going to be effective at all. It's probably going to very quickly start to th have this jury not want to listen to him very much. Well, I'm going to push back a little bit on this because, I, look, this is a tremendously difficult case for him to defend when the bodies of these children are found on his client's property. Now, we heard in opening statements yesterday to suggest maybe the property is bigger than we think, that it wasn't like it was just in front of the front door. It was on the pasture side. Can we really say what the cause of death was for Tammy? How much can you say that she was actually killed when maybe she had other health ailments? And really putting the blame on Alex Cox and Lori Vallow as the people who perpetrated this, and Chad was left in the dark. I thought he gave a really compelling opening statement. I'm curious to see. This is the first cross-examination of the first state witness in the case. But, you know, there is, we get more questions here, Terry, about this. So this is Lido, Lido Leith on YouTube. What exactly is his point, meaning uh, prior? Uh, does he expect the jury to believe that with all of these suspicious deaths, that Tammy just happened to get randomly shot with a paintball gun? Now, remember, she wasn't shot with anything, but she, the allegation was that she was shot at right before her death uh, by Alex Cox. So what exactly do you think that that line of questioning by John Pryor is getting to? Here's the point, Jesse. John Pryor is trying to create some reasonable doubt. And he told the jury during his opening, follow the facts, don't make assumptions. Just because there are coincidences in this case doesn't mean that, in fact, his client was responsible. Now, everybody died back to back. I mean, we saw the missing of the children, everyone getting shot at, meaning Brandon got shot at, meaning that, you know, Tammy ends up dying. Charles Vallow was the first one to be killed or shot. And so I think what John Pryor is trying to say is, look, these things do happen, and perhaps Tammy did die a natural death. You can't jump to a conclusion unless you have all of the facts in place. I don't think it's going to work. I think it's too many coincidences, and I think that jury is not going to believe him, but he's got to help to defend his client, and I think he's creating a little bit of doubt. You just said it. Yep. You know, the fact that, you know, Tammy... She had heart ailments. She had difficulties. And so who knows? You know, one of the things that I think about, and um, I, we're covering this on Sidebar, our podcast here on Law and Crime, I, I'm always reminded by that infamous text that Chad sent to his wife, Tammy, about on the day that they believe these kids were killed or at least buried on the property, where he's talking about that he had to burn these limb debris by the fire pit, that he shot a raccoon. So again, the more that you could say, well, it was Alex Cox who just deposited these bodies on the property on the same day, and, and Chad Daybell knew nothing about it, and sends this message. The coincidence here are just too eerie to go through, but there's just so much to go through. All right, let's continue on the discussion here. Gigi, I'm going to move over to you. Uh, this is a question I'm not sure of. This is an interesting one. This is from Cutter McGilf on YouTube. Chad's children really thought their father was innocent. Wouldn't they have spoken to the police about their mother? Do you know anything about Chad's children spe speaking to police about Tammy? We haven't really heard a whole lot about that. I would imagine if any of his kids have spoken, it would be Garth Daybell because he was there when Chad found Tammy deceased. He was the one that, that actually called 911. Chad eventually took over that phone call. So we don't know for sure. But clearly, they're going to come in as defense witnesses to back up the fact that their mom was sick in spite of everybody else outside of the house saying she was just fine even up to the day before. So they've only given that one interview publicly as well. Um, they've been pretty tight-lipped, and we really haven't seen a whole lot in Lori's trial that would indicate they had talked to police. Okay, so let's, by the way, just want to let everybody know these are great questions. Keep them coming in. Twitter, X. Facebook, YouTube, this is your time. If you have a question about the Chad Daybell case, throw it in there. You do a super chat. It's the best way to get your question up to the top. Uh, but we're going to keep it going. Let me just stick with you for a second, Gigi. Uh, talking about the jury makeup, this is from Chiraz on YouTube. Do we know how many parents are on the jury? I don't really know a number of parents, uh, just not being there in person, but you know, we have 10 men, eight women, so it's pretty pretty even. We don't know who the deliberators will be until right before, but it seems to me that it's a healthy mix, and, you know, I watched all of jury selection. I do have the notes. I don't have them up right now, but ultimately, uh, there were quite a few that were passed through that were parents. How many of those ended up on the jury? I'm not sure. All right, you can come back to that. Um, I'm actually going to throw to Terry for a different question. Really good question. 
This is from uh, Tessa. These are all great questions, but this one is a very good legal question. This is from Tessa Bowery on YouTube. Tessa, thanks for coming back. I know that she was, uh, uh, Tessa was on with us yesterday. Uh, is prior not being death penalty licensed, does that affect any future appeals Chad may have? It's an excellent question, Tessa. Yes, I think it does. I mean, look, he tried to get off the case before, as we talked about yesterday. He is not death penalty qualified. There could be some problems with that. Maybe he didn't ask the right questions during voir dire. And it is a ground for appeal. Now, he, we know there was that motion where someone was trying to come in. Theoretically, that person was a death penalty qualified attorney. That's sealed. We haven't seen it. We don't know. But... You know, he tried to get off the case. The judge said no. He's asked for help. And just to be clear, there is a difference between being a regular trial lawyer fighting for Chad Daybell's innocence in that court versus the second stage of this case if he's convicted the death penalty. That's a different qualification. That's a different skill set, right? Well, absolutely. But you should get a death qualified attorney in there when, in fact, you are picking the jury, not just for that second phase. He should be there or she should be there for the entire trial to help with the selection process and to help with the questioning of the witnesses. And certainly during that penalty phase, when in fact they are going through the aggravating and mitigating circumstances. All right, Gigi, going to go back to you. Don't know if you have any more uh, thoughts about the jury makeup, but I do have more questions for you. Um, this is from Air S on YouTube. Was that confirmed that Alex Cox died of natural causes in the autopsy? It was. Uh, he died, actually, the day that they were having an all-agency meeting about the case. FBI, all the different agencies were there. Towards the end, they got the word that he was the subject of a 911 call. So the FBI attended his autopsy, but ultimately it was a pulmonary embolism, and he was cremated, although they did save samples for future testing. But yeah, closed out as a natural death. Mm. Let me stick with you uh, for a second here, Gigi. Do we know, this is from Ashley Church, 1237 from YouTube. Is anyone from Chad's family there in the courtroom? Now, I know we kind of got this question yesterday, if there's any supporters of his in that courtroom. Uh, did you get any sense? I know you have some sources there. Yeah, I haven't heard uh, today either that anybody's there supporting him. Mm. Nobody. Okay, let's uh, keep it going. I'm going to go to you, Terry. This is from Sherry Mango on YouTube, Long Crime Network. Do you see the same witnesses in this trial as Lori's? Um, now, I will tell you that this is going to be a different trial and a longer trial because of the death penalty aspect of it. But do you think we're going to be seeing overlap, same witnesses? I do. There were 59 witnesses in Lori's trial. We're already seeing some overlap with the detective on the stand. And I think we will see more overlap and we'll see a additional witnesses because you heard John Pryor say during his opening statement that he is calling four expert witnesses to talk about that DNA, mostly forensic individuals. And so I definitely think we're going to see some of the same people, some of the same police officers, those people who investigated the case, some of the same witnesses. I definitely think we're going to see people like Zulima, people like, you know, Melanie Gibb, who have been supportive of the prosecution's allegations. And so I think it would make total sense to bring them back again. Gigi, over to you. We got a bunch of questions about Tammy Daybell. Uh, let me go to this. This is from Air S on YouTube. Another good question. Was Tammy alive when Tylee and JJ were murdered? I forgot. The answer, I believe, is yes, right? Because she didn't die until October and the kids were presumed to die in September, right? That's correct. And they were in her backyard for uh, weeks before she was murdered, which right. is very horrifying to think about just in general. And she was a librarian, worked with kids. Um, just, yeah. And, yeah, they were in the yard for weeks before she was killed. And that's why Chad had sent that text message to Tammy. Well, I've had an interesting morning. I felt I should burn all the limb debris by the fire pit before it got too soaked by the oncoming storms. Uh, while I did so, I spotted a big raccoon along the fence. I hurried and got my gun, and he was still walking along. I got close enough that one shot did the trick. He is now in our pet cemetery fun times. Again, the allegation would be he sent all that as a way to cover up what was being done in their yard. Um, but Gigi, let me stick with you for a second. We have a question from Little Old Me 24 on YouTube. How long before Tammy died was Lori shopping for rings? As early as May. So Tammy Daybell was murdered October 19th, and, and it was in May that she actually ordered, so I believe it was in May, that she ordered a set of Malachite rings on Etsy 
but the person that made those rings was a student and couldn't fulfill the order. And ultimately, she used Charles Vallow's Amazon account to order those rings and have them delivered up there in Idaho. So May, at least, we're, we're trying to order rings and looking at wedding dresses and all that stuff months before. Hmm. All right, let's keep the questions coming. Facebook, Twitter, X, YouTube, we'll keep answering them. Terry, I'll go to you. This is from Yusaki, Yusaki, Yusaki Wee, uh, 1986 on YouTube. What was the blessing that Chad gave Alex over the phone right before Alex Cox died? Do you remember? Yes, I definitely remember. And I think that the blessing was given to him at that time because Chad probably knew, and this is speculation, that he was going to die. The blessing was because he has been following all of the things that he's supposed to do, that he's um, risen in the, uh, you know, the religion and, and that he is going to be part. That was actually how they were enticing him. At least that's the allegation that, you know, Chad and Lori were enticing him all along to do their dirty deeds, saying that he will be blessed and he will be part of those individuals who are, you know, looked at specially as far as this religion is concerned. So he was blessed and then he passed away. Gigi, let's take it back to the kids for a second. Um, you know, it's such a tragedy. It is absolutely heartbreaking, particularly when you're hearing today about the remains of these children. The, the, this jury did not even hear from the medical examiner yet, right? They did not going to know. We know because we followed Lori's trial uh, about the graphic state in which they were found. What happened to these kids? I mean, JJ was asphyxiated. He was basically suffocated. He had tape all around his body. Um, Tylee's remains were burned. Um, it, it's just horrifying, horrifying to think about this. So the question I asked for you is from Simone U. Nothhouse on YouTube. Hi, y'all. Have the kids had a decent burial and service yet? The kids' remains were just recently released to the families. Uh, as far as services, I haven't heard anything about any future, uh, you know, funerals or anything like that. But after years of being in the possession um, of the FBI and the police departments, they were released to the families, which I know is a big relief, especially for Kay and Larry. Uh, it's hard to think, you know, where your grandchild is for years. And um, I think when that happened, it gave them a little bit of peace of mind that at least he was home, um, you know, that he was he was not a part of this, that that part of him was not a part of this anymore. Right. So uh, but still nothing about any kind of funeral arrangements. I think they want to get through this trial. You know, this is tough. A little easier, according to Larry, second time around. They loved Lori. Lori was a part of their family. So they had that element with her trial. I think this trial, there's a little bit less of, uh, well, there's zero emotional attachment to this defendant. So um, maybe once all this judicial stuff wraps up, they can focus their attention solely on laying these children to rest mm -hmm. properly. It's You don't have full closure yet, right? I mean, it was one thing no. to ultimately get the conviction and the sentence against Lori Vallow Daybell, um, but now you got to go to chat and think about what his role is here or alleged role here and ultimately. Right. Family. And then you they still have Charles. You still you have still Charles. Have you still have Charles. Arizona. Um, that's very yeah. true. Yep. You still have because she's facing um, conspiracy to commit murder charges with Charles Vallow out in Arizona, who was killed by Alex Cox. Originally, the idea was that it was self defense. Take that for what you will. Uh, let's move this on. So, Terry, I'll go to you. This is from Mespinoza from YouTube. Why bury them on your own property, though? Were they that confident that no one would come looking for the kids, or am I missing something? And, and remind us all, I believe it was the cell phone records of Alex Cox that kind of led, led them back to that property. That's a good question, right? It's a great question. I don't think if I were a defendant in this case, if I were Chad Daybell, I would have those bodies buried in our backyard. I mean, obviously, the first place I think the law enforcement is going to look is close by. But, you know, he thought that he was above the law. He thought that you know, he was the brother of Jesus. He thought he could do it all and get away with it. And in fact, Lori and Chad thought that they were justified in what they did. So I don't think they thought there was anything wrong with burying the bodies in the backyard there. And by the way, Gigi, I'm right. It was the cell phone records of Alex Cox that led them back to the property. Right. I mean, within feet of each burial site, yes, which what I'm interested in learning with Chad's data that they get from his cell phones and all of his electronics, where was he when the kids were being buried? Because if he had his phone in his pocket 
they may be able to put him right beside Alex Cox, which is going to be bad, bad news if it wasn't already for Chad. Mm. All right. We got some great legal questions coming in. So we're going to, again, Facebook, Twitter, X, YouTube. Now's the time. We're going to be doing this for the next uh, 20 minutes or so, 25 minutes. Uh, Tam, uh, sorry, Terry, Terry, let me go to you. This is from Ghost Ranger from YouTube. Is there any way that Chad could stop the trial, plead guilty, and get life in prison? Yes. Anything can happen. Do you think they'd accept it? That's an excellent question. I think. And by that, I mean, do you think prosecutors would accept it? Yes, I think they would. And here's why. It's very difficult to, and you've said this before, Jesse, and I agree with you one million percent, it's difficult to get a jury to agree on the death sentence. It's hard to put someone to death, even if you have all of the aggravating factors. We've seen it in other cases. And so I think if, in fact, in the middle of the trial, Chad said, look, this doesn't look good. I, I want to take a plea. He is able to do that. It's not certain or guaranteed that the prosecution will accept it, but I think they probably would. You'll save taxpayer dollars if, in fact, he does it at any time in the near future, and you are guaranteed that he's convicted and he's put away for life. And I wouldn't agree to it if I were the prosecution unless it was something like life without parole. And he gives up his uh, right to appeal it. So there, that's Correct. it. That's the end of the line. Okay. Let me go to you, Gigi. This is from Small Squall from YouTube. Why did they think Chad couldn't be convicted in Arizona uh, for what happened with uh, either Brandon Boudreau or also uh, Charles Vallow? Why did they think Chad couldn't be convicted in Arizona? I just think, again, it comes down to a lack of electronic evidence because that's where a lot of evidence in this case has come from. And um, we have him talking about, I wonder if he changed it after he had two bullets in his chest. I mean, there are things that look really bad, but I guess at the end of the day, there just wasn't enough there to show he was actively in the planning of Charles being murdered. So I, we all were kind of shocked when that decision was made, but, you know, it is what it is. I thought, I thought from what I've seen, it seemed very clear that he was very much in on it, but. I'm not sure about the laws of knowing about a murder and not reporting it. So that's kind of out of my out of my league. All right. Go to Terry. What do you think? You know, I think it's very interesting, Jesse. One of the things that John Pryor said during his opening statement was Alex shot Charles Vallow. And then he waited before calling 911 and then took the shot, the kill shot, so to speak. So before this, everyone was thinking. The two shots occurred, then he called 911. But John Pryor sort of mixed that up. I don't know if anybody caught that. And I mention it because if Chad was there, and he was, if he was there at some point, or was he there, JJ? No, Chad was, okay. was not in, All right. in uh, Arizona. Yeah, okay. So I was thinking, yeah, that's probably one of the reasons why they didn't bring it, because he, he wasn't there. But it did make me think about why did John Pryor say, what is... What does John know? This is what I was thinking, that Chad might have said, the only way that Pryor knows this is if Chad said something to him. And Chad would know that because he had a conversation with Alex. Mm. I mean, it's kind of a stretch, but I, I, I do think they had some information against Chad, but not enough to convict him. All right, we got a question from CG Mad from YouTube. Do we know the makeup of the jury? I'll answer this one. 18 jurors, 10 men, eight women, and six random alternates. All right, let's keep it going. Um, all right, so, oh, this is an interesting one. This is uh, for you, Gigi. This is from Natasha Naylor on YouTube. Are they allowing Lori to watch this trial live? I have a contact who's in prison in a different state, and she has told me in the common rooms they do watch long crime. They watch all the different, uh, anything they can see. It, you would think that would be the last thing you want to watch. So it depends on her facility. She has tablets, uh, which has access to some things, but it's not like the internet, like our tablets. It's very restricted. So if she is, it would have to be in a common room with that channel set on there. Mm. All right, over to you, Terry. Another interesting legal question here. This is from Henriette Erasmus from YouTube. Uh, what will happen if Chad is found not guilty on Tammy's death? Remember, it's conspiracy to commit her murder and her mur first degree murder. Um, so let's say he's found not guilty with respect to Tammy's death. Lori was already found guilty on conspiracy to Tammy's death. Will that charge on Lori fall away, right? That's interesting because a conspiracy, you need an agreement. Uh. 
right? You need an agreement well, between that, two or more people. That's actually an excellent hypothetical. If, in fact, he's found not guilty for either the conspiracy or the murder of Tammy, what would happen to the murder conviction? I don't think anything would happen. Well, because the reason I think the about conspiracy. it is the, the reason I think about it is because you can charge somebody with conspiracy and they could, you could have an unindicted co-conspirator. You don't necessarily have to get a conviction against another person to have it stand. All right, right? so we just answered the question. I mean, I mean exactly. that's my, my and, guess. And also, the jury is looking at different pieces of information for both the trials, and they're not going to overturn that because of something that happened in Chad's trial. Mm. All right, let's keep it going. We got uh, Stephanie Albiston from YouTube. Gigi, what was the point of the raccoon story? Like, I get he was trying to cover up but did he think Tammy wouldn't have known the difference between a raccoon and a human that she'd come across remains? I think that it went to explain the disturbance in the soil right there in the pet cemetery um, because there you could see on satellite the same day Tylee was buried, that disturbance in the soil. One thing to note, too, is that investigators picked up on the fact that this text from Chad to Tammy was totally out of the ordinary. It did not follow their normal text pattern. It was a lot more detailed, a lot lengthier. Um, so that that comes into that whole, what a coincidence. The gunshot, we're still not sure. I mean, we haven't heard anything that would indicate, uh, we don't know how Tylee was killed, but I think just that lined up with the story of why if she comes home from work and you've got a fresh grave in that pet cemetery, the raccoon story would maybe cover for that, at least to her. And sometimes defendants... Oh, they get themselves into more trouble by trying to cover it up and creating an explanation right. like that, sending a text on the very day that we think the, the Alex Cox's phone was pinged there, the very day that we think the bodies were uh, deposited there. Not the day after, not the day before, but that day is just really bad evidence for him. And I'm going to be curious to see how John Pryor gets away uh, through it. Um, let me go over to you, Terry. We got a question from Peggy Breinbach. Uh, this is from YouTube. Anybody's thoughts? Do you think Chad has any chance to at least get off of the death penalty? I don't and hope not. That's what the Peggy said. You know, I think he has a chance. I do. You think that the jury will say life in prison? I think there's a chance the jury will say life in prison. And again, I mean, we talked about this before. It's really hard to put someone to death. And some people do believe that having a life term without parole is more punishment than a death sentence because, you know, you're just sitting for the rest of your life. You know you can't do anything else. You have to continuously think about all that you've done in terms of the horrific crimes. And so, I mean, that's a lot of punishment. And I think a lot of people would think that that might be sufficient. Not everyone. And, and look, th this is a jury, a death penalty qualified jury, meaning that they said they're open to voting in favor of the death penalty based on the facts and the evidence, but they could always say no. And I keep reminded of the Parkland school shooting case one of the worst mass shootings we've ever covered, horrendous situation, heartbreaking victim impact statements, and the jury in the end uh, ultimately voted for life in prison. And so, Jesse, with that, I was shocked, and there were so many aggravating yep. factors. Yep, because that's what it is, aggravating versus mitigating factors. Uh, let me throw it to you, Gigi, though. What's your opinion on whether or not uh, he could be ultimately sentenced to death? Yeah, I think it's possible. Juries are unpredictable. And when it you can say you're willing to give death, but when it comes down to it, are you able to? I mean, can you? I think these days, life in prison, for the most part, we do hear people being executed, but it's Idaho. It's not an often occurrence there. And for me personally, it's okay if he gets life because that saves the families from all these appeals over the years. You know, they never get to put that to rest. And uh, I think life in prison would be perfect for Chad. Although I'm not a huge supporter of the death penalty in general, uh, there are cases, and this is one. So um, I, I'll tell you, Jesse, after looking at these crime scene photos in person last year, with the exception of a few, um, if this case does not stir that in you, that, you know, an eye for an eye, I don't think many will, because it is horrific. Um, let me stick with you, Gigi. This is from State Shun Sunshine from YouTube. Where was Tammy when the children were buried in the backyard? Probably working to support Chad. I mean, to be honest, she had a full-time job as a librarian. Chad really was just doing his books and his little talks, and his books made around 2000 a year. So largely, Tammy was the one supporting that household uh, for a very long time, in fact. Let me go to you, Terry. Another legal question. This is from Domesthenius from YouTube. If you were defending this trial, what would your move be? And do you think that mens rea would come into play given Chad's 
professed beliefs. So I'm assuming that's kind of like a mental health yes. uh, kind of argument. Yeah, I mean, look, one of the first things I would do if I were defending Chad Daybell is to say, look, you should take a plea here. But if I were defending him in the trial, as far as that mens rea is concerned, you know, in Idaho, there is no um, insanity defense. Right. I mean, right. they can show that he didn't have, as our smart viewer has asked, he didn't have the mental capacity, the mens rea, the knowledge to go the intent to go so far as to commit this crime because he was thinking that he had the right to do this, that he was told that these were dark spirits, et cetera, et cetera. But I think that's going to be difficult to prove because he knew what he was doing, even if he thought he was motivated by these, you know, supposedly dark and light spirits and these were zombies. He knew what he was doing when these murders were taking place, particularly as it relates to Tammy, if in fact he was the one specifically involved with her killing. And I, I, I even with Lori Vallow Daybell, I mean, so twisted. I, I've wrestled with this. If the insanity defense was on the table, could she be found insane? I think there's a possibility. But also I say to myself, there were so many times that she didn't give the answer what happened to the kids, even to Colby Ryan. And if you really believe that this was justified and you're, you're mindset is so warped that you thought this was all right, you would say it. Yeah, we, we, we killed them because we had to get the demons out. Why, why am I being arrested? I don't get it. I did nothing wrong. Now, that's a very extreme example, but there were steps that were taken to hide what happened. But, Absolutely. Um, all right, let me just stick with you for a second, uh, Terry. We got another question, um, and, and it's a legal question about what we're seeing from John Pryor. So this is from Emily Barbato from YouTube. If Pryor will be trying to pin everything on Alex and Lori, why would he be trying to discredit the defense, the detective's belief, Ray Hermcio, that it was not a paintball gun that shot at Tammy? It makes no sense to me. Good point. Like, why are you fighting against that? Shouldn't you just say, yeah, Alex Cox uh, tried to shoot Tammy. My client didn't. Right. I, you know, I think it's all part and parcel of the fact that Pryor is trying to say that the investigation was flawed in some way because you've jumped to these conclusions and you don't know if that was a paintball or a real gun or what's your evidence to all of that. I mean, where's the hard concrete evidence? And so I think he's just trying to say in every way he can at every point that, look, this investigation was flawed. You had already come to a foregone conclusion before you found out all of the real evidence because you did not know at that time right. what this was. Over to you, uh, Gigi Yvette Mariel from YouTube. Do you think Lori will divorce Chad after seeing her tossed under the bus, or will she stay in her delusional life and belief? I do not see Lori Vallow divorcing Chad Daybell. She is, I mean, she's all in. She's committed. We see now Chad not so committed, willing to throw her under the bus and back over her for good measure. No, I think if anybody divorces, it would be Chad. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. That would be interesting. Uh, let me just follow this up with you, Gigi. This is from, excuse me, Samantha Stewart from YouTube. <clears throat> Question. Do Lori and Chad currently communicate? If not, will they be allowed to after he's sentenced? So this is foregone conclusion that he's going to be convicted and sentenced. Uh, and, you know, definitely a possibility. But do they communicate or will they be allowed to communicate? We haven't heard if they're communicating currently. She actually emailed me um, last year towards the end, so I bit just to see if I could find out that very thing. And um, she took my stamps and ran. So I didn't have getting scammed by Lori Vallow on my bingo card last year with her in solitary, but you, hey. You tried to write uh, her? She wrote me. She wrote Jesse, you. Right after the, yes, she sent me three emails asking for media money. I had stamps on that account where I talked to a contact of mine. I can't use them, send them her way. She knew who I was. Wow. I was at her trial every day. I said, hey, you know, if you ever want to chit chat, um, I talked to some some people involved in the case, made sure they were cool with it. They were like, yeah, see what we can find out. But we don't know if they're communicating or not. I tried, but she took my stamps and ran. Oh, my gosh. Can you imagine that interview? <laughs> wow. I don't even know where to begin if that were to happen. Um, by the way, just yeah. focusing on that for a second here, Terry, there's a very similar issue happening in the Crumbly case. The Cr Crumbly case put forward... Now that they've all been convicted and they're all serving time, do they have a constitutional right to, to now be in contact with one, with one another? And I think it's interesting because there's one thing to say, they're co-defendants, maybe they shouldn't have the ability to talk with one another before trial, you know. But now that they're all convicted, do, do they have a constitutional right to be a family? Well, that issue did come up and it was actually argued as 
I recall it. And the defense was saying, yes, they do have a constitutional right. This is family. Because this is very similar. Correct. Yeah. This is family. They have a right to talk to each other. There's no you know, chance or possibility that they're going to taint any trials at this point because they've been convicted. Now, there are appeals, and perhaps at the end of the day, you can argue that they shouldn't be able to talk to each other until all of the appeals are taken. But I think at this point, after the convictions, it's no harm in them going forward and having a conversation between themselves. It'll be recorded, but at least they can talk to each other. Gigi, over to you. We got a question from Bookworm from YouTube. Has Lori filed an appeal yet? My understanding is she has. She has, yeah. That was pretty quick after her trial. I think there was a uh, certain window of when she had to, and she did. And I think she said her constitutional rights were violated. Yes, and part of it was based on the mental illness factor. I remember reading in one of the reports that you know, that was one of the claims that the fact that she wasn't competent to stand trial, she should not have been deemed competent. And that was one of the grounds for appeal that she shouldn't have had trial at all. And by the way, one of the reasons she's not, she didn't face the death penalty was because of a mistake the prosecution made in terms of discovery. Um, would have been very interesting to see if they would have, if death penalty was on the table for her, if they would have uh, sentenced her to death. All right, going over to you, Gigi, this is from Sweet Mel Melisol from YouTube. Wonder if Chad's kids still believe he's 100% innocent before their mom's body was exhumed. I haven't heard if they changed their mind on his involvement. I've heard rumblings, maybe one or two might not be as supportive as they were. And that was sort of confirmed yesterday when Pryor said that three or four of Chad's kids, of, of Chad and Tammy's kids would testify about her failing health. So that sort of fit in there for me, but uh, as, as far as at least the majority We've heard 100% they think he was set up, that they do not think that he killed their mother. And they're, I mean, they've held that belief since he was arrested, and it's been years. Mm, and we've had a trial with a lot of evidence coming out that had text pretty much showing he was ready for Tammy to die. So at this point, if, if what they've heard so far doesn't convince them, I'm not sure anything will. Two weeks after she dies, the woman he'd been married to since 1990, he's out in Hawaii getting married, frolicking on the beach, happy as can be. Benefits from her life insurance policies. I'm not even a prosecutor. I'm just laying out what we see here. All right, let me go to you, Terry. Uh, we got a question here um, from, oh, Thad, the, the, Mad, the Mad Mac, the Mad Mac. Better from you YouTube. than me, Jesse. <laughs> Will, with the appeals process and lack of needed drugs for lethal injection, wouldn't the death penalty be almost a life sentence, or what options are available in Idaho for execution? Interesting question with the Brian Koberger case also in the news? Correct. You know, my understanding is that they have a number of options as far as that's concerned. I thought I also read that there was someone not that long ago in Idaho who was subject to the firing squad. So yeah. let me get back to that uh, viewer. I think that's excellent. What is the means? Well, they authorized the firing squad as a method of ex exactly. execution, I think, last year. So that's, again, a question that comes on the table. Um, Gigi, I'll throw it to you if you want to answer that. Or if you want to answer this question from Susie Homemaker from YouTube, uh, what did Chad shoot the raccoon with? Um, back to the, the execution, I, for some reason, I think maybe that was a, they couldn't get a vein or something like right, that. And the right. firing squad yeah. is back on the table in Idaho. And what was the question about the raccoon? What did, I'm sorry. What did Chad shoot the raccoon with or that he claimed? He, he said got. he went and he said he went and got his gun. And when he got back, the raccoon was still on the fence and he, it took one shot. So I'm assuming a handgun or. You know, something that he had. They didn't specify what type of gun. Well, we haven't heard about that so far. Let me just follow this up real quick from State Sunshine from YouTube. Did they find the raccoon's remains in the burial pit cemetery, Gigi? They did not. They found a dog and a cat, I believe, but no raccoon. How convenient that was. How interesting that right. was. All right. Real quick, Terry, give you one more question. Um, Tessa Bowery from YouTube. How will they spin everyone asking Chad for directions if Lori was the mastermind? 20 seconds. Oh, my goodness. I think they're going to say that uh, Lori was the mastermind that, you know, Pryor is definitely going to argue that Chad wasn't the one because, you know, she enticed him and she is the one who even long before her brother Alex shot at um, Charles Vallow. Correct. Shot at Charles Vallow. And uh, yeah, it was it, that she was the one who was manipulating. Yeah, absolutely. Everything. She's the one who came up to him. We'll see. 
Terry Austin, Gigi McKelvey, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. That does it for us on our Q&A session. I want to remind you all that you can keep you can head over to our channel for continuing coverage. We'll be right back right after this. Brian Buckmeyer's up next.
Thank you. Please be seated. Mr. Pryor, are you ready to continue with your cross-examination? Yes, Judge. Okay, we'll go ahead and have the jurors brought in. Mr. Sure. Judge, would you prefer to wait? And... It's up to you. You can go take the podium if you'd like, or you can wait at the council table. All right, please. <laughs> Is present in council. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, we are back on the record on case CR 2221-1623, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Davo. The defense is conducting cross examination of the witness, Detective Hermosillo. Mr. Pryor, if you'd like to continue, you may. Okay. Officer Hermosillo, I'm going to take my time. I didn't probably need too much coffee this morning, so I waited out over the lunch hour, and now I think I'm okay. Let's hope so. And that I think the uh, judges admonished me enough at this point that I think I got the point. <laughs> so uh, we're going to go a little slower, if you don't mind. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to go back to the paint bullets. And you said that uh, one of the pieces of evidence was that Alex Cox had Googled a uh, black uh, Dodge Dakota, correct? But he Googled what caliber it would take to shoot through the windshield of Dodge Dakota. <laughs> was it the windshield? Yes, I believe so. Okay. Um, Judge, there's previously been an admission of um, Exhibit 34 by stipulation. That's Homer J. Maximus with a reference to the state as well. Um, and we'll get back to that in a minute. But um, so uh, there was at least a reference at some point that there was going to be a trying to find out what kind of caliber it would take to penetrate uh, a Dodge Dakota vehicle, somewhat, windshields or otherwise, correct? Correct. And you took that as a threat, uh, um, as a means of saying that's why uh, Alex Cox was trying to kill Tammy Davo. That Google search, along with him being at that residence that same day earlier. Okay. And the incident involving Tammy Daybell. Okay. Okay. That, okay. And those that's what drew you to that conclusion. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So we don't know who was driving the Dodge Dakota regularly, do we? Because he didn't speak with the kids. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. 
And we do know that on the day that you said Chad Daybell, at least you were alleging that Chad Daybell fled on uh, sometime in June, uh, June, June 9th. Is that Obje right? Objection in the states, the testimony. Well, try to clarify that. High rate of speed, uh, Chad Daybell left the, the area. Is that fair? That's fair. That's what you're stating, correct? That's correct. And in the vehicle that he was in, do you know that that was the Dodge Dakota that supposedly he was fleeing in? It was not Dodge Dakota he was fleeing in. Okay, what vehicle was he fleeing in? Uh, I can't recall off the top of my head. We have it in the inbound, but it wasn't the Dodge Dakota. Okay. Okay. So there were two vehicles, an Equinox and a Dodge Dakota. Which, which, day, which day, sir? On June 9th. Which there are two vehicles that the Daybells owned, the Equinox and the Dodge Dakotas. Which one was it that he was allegedly fleeing? I just did. I can't recall the vehicle that okay. was arrested. Okay. okay, that's that's fair. That's fair. So, um, just to recap, we know that there was a Google search by Alex Cox on his Homer J. Maximus account, correct? Correct. And that there was an allegation that someone was, or that Ms. Alex Cox was trying to figure out what type of caliber to at least shoot at a, uh, uh, a black Dodge Dakota, correct? Correct. Okay. We don't know who the target was uh, or who was the target was in that Dodge Dakota, but we know someone who owned the vehicle, obviously, right? Well, I would assume so. Okay. Okay. Now, that's what you based on the fact that you thought that there was an attempt on um, Tammy Daybell that, that day, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, uh, did, when you read that email from the Homer J, or the search from the Homer J Maximus account, did you take into consideration the date of when that search took place? Uh, I did. And when was that? I can't recall. I have to refer to my notes. Okay. I'm going to um, take the liberty of helping you out a little bit. I think I'm going to help you Judge, I don't know why it's not going up on the screen. Is this a exhibit? 34. 34, sorry. Which 34 has sub exhibits? Is I believe it's A, Judge. 34A is admitted previously by stipulation. 34A is what you're trying to publish, Mr. Clark? Yes, Judge. Uh, I don't know if there's some. One can assist to see you, but the okay, it is in the middle. There we go. I'm sorry, and I don't know what all the best play plans to prepare for this. So, I'd like you to take a look up at the screen if you would. Um, look at the date of when uh, this uh, uh, search took place, okay? And what is that date, October 12th of 2019? Okay, now what was the date that allegedly Tammy Daybell was shot out with a paintball gun? October 9th, 2019. So, if I understand, the, the incident with the paintball gun took place three days before this search took place. Correct. 
Okay. But you still continue to believe that was the basis for someone going after um, Tammy Daigle, is that right? That's correct. Okay. All right. But you don't have any Google searches that suggest anything else in a threatening manner. This is the one and only that you're relying on. Is that right? No, that's not right. All right. What else are you relying on? If you scroll up on October 9th, I believe that evening. Okay. Go ahead. Alex Cox Googles. Uh, how to make an AR-15 function in cold weather. Okay. Um, there's some other Googles if you'd like to pull up. Well, I've got those and we're going to go through those. And we'll have an opportunity to do that. But and that was and that was the night Tammy was shot at. Okay. And he and he Googled that night, right? That's correct. What time of night was that to your call? I'd have to look at my notes. Okay. Okay, but he also had a habit of Googling a lot of things, right? I can't answer that. Well, you talk you you know about the head of elector thing, right? No, sir. Oh, okay. Well, before we get to the head of electric thing, let's talk a little bit about some of the other searches from Homer J. Maximus. October 21. Best tactical cutting news, right? Correct. See that one? All right, mm -hmm. Mr. Pryor, you are going to have to stay by that microphone or we don't pick up what it said. Good judge. October 22nd, 2019. Sharpening swords. Knife sharpener, right? Correct. Okay, what was the date of um, Tammy Daybell's death? October 19th, 2019. Okay, so three days after Tammy Daybell dies, Alex Cox is still looking at sharpening swords and a block knife sharpener three days after Tammy Daybell's death. Is that right? Correct. Okay. October 23rd, 4 days after Tammy Daybell's died, 15 facts about the silence and the lambs you didn't know. Call that one? No, sir. Okay. And that was three, four days after Tammy dies, right? That's sure. Okay. Now, when you searched, um, and I, I believe it was um, 107, was that the unit that we found all of the knives and the guns? No, sir, that was 175. Okay, 175, that was Lori Vallow's unit then, right? That was the unit that Lori Vallow lived in, but Alex Cox was on the uh, tenant agreement. Okay, okay. And... Your testimony previously, I believe that was a day or so ago, it was there were a significant number of uh, weapons found, right? That's true. Did you do a check on all of those weapons to see who they belonged to? I personally did not do a check on all of those weapons. What about the knives or the ammunition? Did you check and see who those belonged to? I'm not quite sure how to check on who the knives I don't belong either. to. I don't either. I just asked because I... So... Um, are you presuming that the owner of those knives and guns and ammunition is Alex Cox? They were found amongst his belongings, so oh, I do like this. Now, we talked about this before um, when I was doing some blood urinative objection uh, that 
a lot of those items were items, the knives and the, the ammunition were items that you pulled out of bags and displayed for purposes of, of um, for lack of a better word, staging them for your photo op, right? That's correct. Okay. Okay. But again, the all of the ammunition, all of the weapons, all of the knives, and the, the, the ski mask, that was uh, found in Alex Cox's, uh, at or near Alex Cox's belongings, right? Correct. So you're... I don't want you to speculate, but you're presuming that Alex Cox owned all of this, right? That's correct. There's no indication that uh, that Lori Vallow had several guns and knives and things like that. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay. <clears throat> I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, And I want to talk to you a little bit about um, Charles Vallow. Okay. Okay. And I assume you've been communicating with the folks down in Arizona about all of that. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. So you're well versed in the facts as it relates to Charles Vallow, correct? Um, no, I wouldn't say well versed. I know the basics. Okay. But are part of the basics to know uh, where the court proceedings are and who was charged with what? Um, you would have to be more specific. Okay, and, and do you know currently who's charged in the death of Charles Vallow? Uh, yes. Okay, who is that? Lori Vallow. Okay, are, are, you, are you aware that the prosecuting attorney down in Maricopa County issued a... Objection here, Sam? That's the same. Judge, I'm asking him whether he's aware, not whether he... Well, by the time you say what he's aware of, then all the information is coming through his yeah. so it's sustainable. Okay. Are you aware that Chad Daybell is not charged with anything in Maricopa County relating to Charles Vallow? Yes, I am. Okay. Okay. Brandon Boudreaux is next. Who's been charged in the allegations against Brandon Boudreaux? Lori Vallow. Is there anybody else? Not that I'm aware. Okay, and you're also aware that, Char that Chad Daybell has not been charged in the allegations as they relate to Brandon Boudreaux. Is that right? That's right. Okay. Now, if Alex Cox was still alive, uh, there's the suggestion seems to be that he would have been charged with uh, both of those offenses. Would that be fair? Jackson calls for speculation. So same. Okay. Do you do you have any information as to who killed Charles Vallow? Uh, yes. Who do you believe killed Charles Vallow? Alex Cox. Okay. Who do you believe took the shot at Brandon Boudreaux? Alex Cox. Okay. Thank you. Now, did you have the occasion to um, look into the history of Alex Cox a little bit? Uh, briefly. Okay. Were you aware of an incident that occurred in, um, let me get the date right, uh, August 5th of 2007? You'd have to be more specific about what occurred on that date, sir. On that date, uh, there was an allegation that uh, there was an assault on a um, Joseph Ryan. That's correct. We're familiar. You're familiar with that, is that right? Yes. And in 2007, is there any indication that Chad Daybell knew Lori Vallow in 2007? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. And in that incident, are you aware that uh, Alex Cox committed aggravated assault on Joseph Ryan? Your Honor, at this point, I'm going to object to relevance. I think we're outside the scope of what's happening in this case, Mr. Pryor. Judge, can I approach, please, with counsel? Sure. I'm outside watching.
Judge all right. But I just wanted to reiterate, we had a, an objection that was sustained on um, relevance grounds and the court uh, confirms that objection, uh, including under 403, it's not relevant for purposes of this case. The judge, based on that ruling, the state would move to strike the question. All right, the question is stricken on that topic, won't be uh, allowed. I would like to talk to you a little bit about um, Chad Daybell's phone, and I'd like you to refresh my recollection. Okay. Yeah. You made mention that on the 26th, when you were uh, doing the initial uh, welfare check, you followed up with calls to uh, Mr. Daybell. Is that right? That's right. And your testimony was that. Um, you weren't able to get an answer or the phone was turned off? Every time we called it one straight to voice me like Oh, all right. Um, did you have an opportunity to read, go through Mr. Daybell's phone records? I personally have not, no. So there's no indication that the phone was ever turned off, was there? I can't testify that I didn't go through these records. Sir. Right. But you can testify that it just went to voice. Correct. I can testify he didn't answer. Okay. Now, when you searched Lori Vallow's residence, uh, there weren't any clothes in there. In the residence that she had hanging up with hangers, right? That's correct. Do you have any information to suggest that she had mailed or shipped her clothes to another location? No, I don't. Okay. And then you... Uh, um, at the time, you were aware that Mr. Daybell obviously was, was married to Ms. Ms. Vallow at that point. Is that correct? That's correct. And is it your allegation that Mr. Daybell left on the 26th or 27th and also tried to avoid uh, contact with law enforcement? I can't answer why Mr. Daybell left. All I can answer to you is I wasn't able to get a hold of him after that date. Okay. And after that date, did you happen to check credit cards or phone records or anything like that to try to locate him? Again, sir, I didn't go through Mr. Daybell's phone records. Okay. Did you did you gain any information that Mr. Daybell was going on a vacation around the 26th or 27th of that, the end of the month? We later learned uh, that Mr. Daybell was in California. Okay. And later learned that he was in California, and that was about the time of the 28th or 29th of November. Is that right? I'd have to refer to my notes. Okay. And were you aware of right. them? Okay. And again, maybe the coffee is still affecting me. I'll try to slow down, okay? I'm sorry. Uh, but you're also aware that Mr. Daybell on the 28th being at Knott's Berry Farms, right? Correct. And that was a family vacation with his kids, correct? Uh, I, I can't testify to who was there. Okay, so Mr. Daybell wasn't fleeing. He was on the 26th or 27th of the month when uh, Maury Vallow's closet was empty. Mr. Daybell was on a family vacation. I can't testify that he wasn't fleeing. I can testify that I knew he was in California at a later date. Okay. And you know that later date was the end of November, right? Close to that date, sir, yes. Okay. And you know that subsequent to that, that he went on a trip to uh, Hawaii after that, right? Yes, he was in Hawaii after that. Right. So if, if, if I understand the testimony, Mr. Daybill was uh, at some point after the 26th, went on a planned family vacation at Knox Ferry Farms, right? Uh, I can't testify it was a planned family vacation. Okay, all right, that's okay. And then subsequent to that, he then went to Hawaii on a trip to Hawaii where there was some contact with you folks, correct? Uh, yeah, we made contact with Mr. Daybell in Hawaii. Okay, and how is it that you found that out that he was in Hawaii again? Remind me, please. Through tips that came in through uh, our hotlines that we had set up. And cell right. phone data. Did, and, and this is just a question. I'm, I'm kind of curious. Did maybe you just look at uh, plane records? Are you asking? Yeah, I'm asking. You, did you guys look at three? I can't. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Almost like slow down. Go ahead. I'm sorry, sir. Can you repeat the question, please? Did you just, did at any time, did you just take the initiative to look at plane records? So each officer was tasked with different things. Okay. Uh, we did have an officer that looked through finance 
financial, okay. and I assume he did look through plan records and credit cards. Oh, okay. And uh, if Mr. Davo was flying on a commercial plane or traveling from Boise to uh, Knott's Berry Farm on a commercial plane, in your experience and knowledge of these things, there would have been a record of that, right? That's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Now, um, I'm going to switch gears again a little bit, okay? Please, please forgive me because uh, I just want to make sure I hit all of these subjects. And, and before we go there, I want to make sure you did get a subpoena from my office. Is that correct? That's correct. And you've acknowledged that you've accepted that, correct? Correct. And you were kind enough to contact my office and agree that if I need you to come back, you'll, you'll come back in a time of, a suitable for both of us. Is that fair? Yes. Was there anything else discussed during that phone conversation? Dates that I couldn't get back. Okay, and that was because and we're not going to get into this on, on, to let everybody know because it's nobody else's business, but you have an obligation of some sort, and, and I've acknowledged that, and we're going to work on that. Is that fair? Injection elements? Sustain. Okay. Now, um, as part of your investigation, and I want to spe be specific to J.J. Ballow, okay? Uh, the last known sign of life was the 22nd, is that fair? The last, the last time the known someone was September 22nd of 2019. Right, okay. And the last, um, at least proof of, of life for um, Tylee Ryan was September 8th. Of 2019. Of 2019. So I'll do the math in my head if I can. There's 15 days difference between Tylee Ryan and JJ Vallo. Is that correct? For the last last proof of uh, of living or life. Respect. Rough, yeah, roughly. 15 days. You, you think JJ um, died on around the 9th of September, 8th or 9th of September, and Tylee was the 22nd or 23rd. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay, thank you. Now, as part of the um, investigation, uh, you looked into um, where J.J. Ballow was on the 22nd of September, correct? Correct. And on the evening of the 22nd of September, he was at Lori Vallow's home. That's correct. Okay. And present at that home, staying in that home, were uh, Lori Vallow, correct? Correct. Uh, at least on the 22nd, J.J. Vallow was there, correct? That's correct. Melanie Gibb was there, correct? Correct. And David Warwick was there? Correct. Okay. And on that evening, there were they were conducting some sort of a religious podcast, the three of them, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, the allegation is that JJ was acting up and went into the pair of um, of um, Alex Cox. Correct. And then Alex took JJ into a separate apartment, correct? On on which day? On the twenty second. He took him to apartment one zero seven. Right. His apartment or whoever was on the lease for that apartment, right? That's right. Okay. And then the last time that anybody saw JJ um, was later that evening. Is that fair? Yes. And that was when Alex Cox was carrying JJ Vallow into the apartment of Lori, David, and Melanie Gibb, right? Correct. We were all staying there together, correct? That's correct. And then somewhere at that point, whether it was at that point or subsequent to that evening or that evening, um, that's when you believe that uh, J.J. Vallow was murdered. That's correct. Okay. But the next morning, um, the next morning, uh, there were three people in the apartment at, at that time early in the morning, correct? Jackson Foundation. Well, do you know who was in the apartment early that morning on 23rd? Hold on. It's prior. There's an objection. I think it was all sustained. Do you have any knowledge of who was in the apartment on the 23rd of September, the morning of that morning of 2019? Yes. And who was there? 
David Warwick, Melanie Gibb, and Lori Vallow. Okay. And at that point, you believe that um, JJ Vallow was already dead. I can't testify to the time, but I believe he was killed. Okay. But then within two hours later from that morning, you believe that he was buried on Chad Davos' property. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Okay. Um, you had an occasion to talk with Melanie Gibb and David Warwick. Is that right? That's right. <clears throat> now, you did it a couple of times, if I recall. One by phone, right? With Melanie Gibb? Correct. Sure. And that wasn't recorded, was it? Um, it was recorded. It was recorded? With her attorney? No. No, I'm talking about a regular phone call with Melanie Gibb, without an attorney. Uh, I don't remember a phone call. Okay. All right. We're going to revisit that maybe at another date, but uh, that's fine. But you also went down to um, uh, Provo, Utah. And I'm, I'm going off of memory, but it was Provo, Utah on the 4th of June of 2020. Is that right? Sure. Now, at that point, um, you were interviewing both David Warwick and Melody Gibb about information they had about this, these allegations, correct? Correct. Okay. And um, who, was El who else was there? Um, myself, Lieutenant Ball, uh, and Prosecutor Wood. Okay, so you, the prosecuting attorney, Mr. Wood, Right there? Yes, sir. And um, a lieutenant that you work with and yourself drove down to Provo, Utah. Correct. And was there anybody from any local law enforcement there as well? No. Okay, now there was an effort to um, <clears throat> record that conversation, is that right? Yes, it was recorded. Okay, was the entire thing recorded? Uh, I believe the very beginning wasn't they the uh, recorder malfunctioned or something happened that was recorded but the majority of that interview was recorded the majority of it was recorded. that's correct so if i represent to you that uh, there was uh, 22 minutes of recording on that interview does that sound about the length of what the interview was with melody Gibb? no it doesn't no okay um, would it be helpful if you were able to listen to that recording and view that recording to refresh your recollection? Refresh my recollection. Like about the length of time that recording was? It should have been longer than 22 minutes. I'll be there longer than 22 minutes. How long were you there? Uh, roughly, say about an hour, maybe. Okay. Now, your, your testimony is that it should have been longer than 21 or 22 minutes. Is that right? That's correct. Would it surprise you to learn that, uh, well, you don't know exactly how long that interview took place, though, right? Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't tell you the exact time. And you don't know the length of the recording itself. Is that fair? That's fair. Okay, and in order to determine that, it would be helpful for you to refresh your recollection by listening to the interview, and it would be able to answer those questions for you. Is that fair? That's fair. You know, I'm not yet beyond the scope. We're way beyond the scope of your direct <clears throat> counsel. If also the officer's going to review that, and I permit it, of course, it's not going to be in the presence of the jury. Uh, so I'll also saying the objection on the beyond the scope. Judge, are you talking about beyond the scope of direct examination? Yes. Okay, then officer, we'll revisit that at another time, okay? And we'll leave that for another opportunity um, when I call you back. Now, um, on the day that um, J.J. Vallow was found in June 9th, on June 9th, okay? Your, your, the pictures and the testimony you showed suggested that he was wearing um, 
rent the gyms. And some Sketcher socks, is that right? Sure. Okay, do you have a recollection of what J.J. Ballow was wearing based on your investigation when he was carried by Alex Cox from uh, Alex Cox's apartment to the upstairs of, upstairs of Lori Ballow's apartment? Objection, this calls for hearsay. It doesn't necessarily call for hearsay. It's wondering what he observed him wearing, if you know, so. Yes. Let's have a roll on that. Yeah. Tell me if you know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Okay. Do you know whether or not J.J. Vallow was wearing red pajamas when he was carried upstairs by Alex Cox? Sir, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. okay. And Judge, I think at this point, um, I'm going to save the rest of my questioning for uh, when I call the officer back in my case in chief. That's okay. Very well. You can do that. I'll conclude the cross-examination then. Uh, this time we'll begin with redirect from the state, Mr. Wood. Your Honor, may I be handed States Exhibit 31? <laughs> yes, and States Exhibit 30. Detective, you testified earlier about when you first met Alex or Chad Dano. Correct. Who was he with? Alex Cox. Did he look afraid of Alex Cox? I don't know. Okay. Alex Cox was Chad Dano's brother-in-law, correct? When you met him? That's correct. Detective, so you were you were asked about your beliefs. Is that, is that fair? In in cross examination, you were asked about your beliefs. Yes. Let's, let's talk about your investigation. When you started your investigation, what was the scope of your investigation? Initially, it was to find um, the Jeep from Gilbert, Arizona. And then it expanded, correct? Correct. And then what was the scope of your investigation? To find the whereabouts of JJ and Tylee. And all this time you're collecting information from various sources. That's correct. Your Honor, may I publish <laughs> State's Exhibit 31? Yes. Thank you. you again, you were you were asked about your beliefs, correct? That's correct. And you were asked about your beliefs regarding I'm gonna call it the paintball incident, is that fair? Yes. And when I'm talking about that, what I, what you, to your understanding, what am I referring to? Do you, and the shooting of Timmy Devil. And you testified you don't believe it was a paintball gun. That's correct. Okay. So why not? Through our investigation, we learned that Alex Cox was in the area and on the property of Chad Daybell the morning that Tammy Daybell was shot at October 9th. Through Google searches from Homer J. Maximus, which was Alex's Google account, the night that Tammy Daybell was shot, 
it was a colder evening. And the Google searches were uh, how to make an AR-15 function in the cold weather. And without referring to my notes, I can I refer to my notes. Would it refresh your memory to review your notes? Yes, sir. Your Honor, may the, may the witness look at his report? No objection. Yes, you can look at it, uh, not to testify okay. from to refresh your recollection. So once you look at that, it's now. On October 8th, the night before uh, we believe Tammy was shot at, Alex is Googling drop yardage from 300 yards to 100 yards, um, which we assumed uh, when you're shooting a rifle, you're, you're adjusting your sights to your target. That was the night before. The morning of the shooting, Alex was on Mr. Davell's property. Um, we have him driving up and down the road of Mr. Davell's property and also on the property. Later that evening into the early morning hours of October 10th is when he Googled how to make your AR-15 function in cold weather. Um, so that's why we believe that it wasn't just a paintball gun. We believe that Alex Cox was, was there to shoot Danny Devo. Okay. I'm going to have you look at this timeline. And as far as you're aware, these, these dates are accurate, correct? I'm sorry. As far as you're aware, these, these in person to your investigation, these dates are accurate, correct? That's correct. Did the fact that Tammy Davo died 10 days after that incident have any bearing on whether or not you believed it was a paintball gun? Yes. Did the fact that uh, Chad Davo got married 17 days later have any bearing on your belief whether or not it was a paintball gun? Yes. Did the fact that there were two children buried on Chad Eagle's property have any bearing on whether or not you believed it was a paintball gun? Yes. Did the fact that Lori had, well, did the fact that Lori Vallow's husband died within months of these other deaths have any bearing on your belief of whether or not it was a paintball gun? Absolutely. And finally, did the fact that uh, Brandon Woodrow was shot at on October 2nd, 2019, have any bearing on your belief of whether or not it was a paintball gun? Yes. And it's your belief that Alex Cox was tied to these events, correct? That's correct. Okay. And because you were asked about your beliefs, was it your belief that Chad Abel was tied to these events? Yes. Why? Based in, on our investigation, the, the, the lies that we've been told the fact that uh, we tried to get a hold of the kids' mother, Lori Bello, 
kid's stepfather, Chad Abel, um, their uncle, Alex Cox. We weren't able to get a hold of anybody who were um, left in the dark. Based on all those events, that's what our beliefs were as a collectively. Pursuant to your investigation, you know when Alex Cox died? December 12th, 2019. At any time after Alex Cox died, did Mr. Daybell call the Rexburg police to report that there might be dead children located on his property? No, he didn't. Did he call the Rexburg police with any concerns that perhaps his wife had been harmed by someone? No, he didn't. Did he call the Rexburg police? Before Alex Cox died, say he might be in danger. Judge, we're going beyond the scope. If you walk into our desk, there might be an opportunity to uh, revisit those issues. I'm, I'm going to uh, sustain that objection. So okay, Mr. Wood. Again, so the first time you met Chad Daybell, what was the first thing you asked him? When you had an opportunity to speak to him, he has to answer. This is a response to the cross your world. I asked him when the last time he saw uh, JJ Bella was. And when did he answer? In October, in apartment 107 with Lori Bella. And did you ask for Lori Bella's phone number? I did. And what was his first response? Judge, this has been asked to me. This is a response to the cross over. His response was he didn't know her cell phone. Detective, you were asked a little bit about how you do an investigation. Correct? Correct. And we spoke about the scope of your investigation. In this case, correct. Does your testimony that you followed where the evidence took you in this case? That's correct. No further questions, Your Honor. All right, Mr. Wood. Judge, there were some issues that were opened up. I'd like to have the opportunity to meet the witness. There were a few, so I'll allow a limited recross, particularly considering your statement that you're going to recall the witness, so it'll be limited. But if you'd like to, Mr. Pryor, you may. Detective, there was some testimony about um, how we repeated Thank you. There was some testimony that you uh, uh, had the whereabouts of Alex Cox on the property of Chad Dayville, and that would have been on the 9th? That's correct. Of October. Yes. Do you have a recollection of how long he was there on that property? I don't. Okay. And you're basing that knowledge on his phone records and his pings, right? Correct. Did you have an occasion to look at all of Alex Cox's whereabouts on that day? By way of his phone records, or did you just look at that specific time? We were more interested in that specific time. Okay, and, and you, I, I gather from your testimony that you didn't look at between 8 and 10 o'clock on the 9th when the paintball incident took place. You, you didn't look at that time for Alex Cox's whereabouts, did you? If I remember right, I didn't get his location uh, near the property at that time. There was no location. Okay. And uh, isn't it true, officer, that he didn't get his location at that time because Alex Cox's phone was pinging in Idaho Falls at that time, some several miles away? I can't testify to that. Okay. Okay. But you know he wasn't on the property by way of all of the metadata. That's the word you used, right? Metadata? Right. By the metadata, Alex Cox wasn't on the Daybell property when Tammy Daybell was shot at with a paintball gun, correct? No, sir. I can't answer that. I can answer that 
Alex Cox's cell phone or his device was not on the property. Okay, and you could also uh, say that his device was on Chad Nagel's property uh, sometime in the morning of the, uh, the 9th of October, right? And driving down the roadway in front of the property. Right. Sure. And we don't know who else was on the property on the 9th of October, do we? I can't testify to who was on the property. Right. So we don't know if he was there by himself or is he there with other folks, correct? Well, that's correct. Okay. And when we're talking about um, the, you've been on the pro the Dayball property, right? A couple of times. Yes. And you took a photo of the, the car, and we're going to revisit that next time we get together. But um, um, it's not 100 yards from the end of the Daybell driveway to the road, is it? No, sir. Do you have an idea of how, how long that driveway is? Could you, could you give me an idea if you know? If you know. I, I couldn't testify to that. Is it 50 yards? No, I would say maybe... 30 maybe 30 yards 20 30 yards yeah. so 60 to 90 feet that's my rough guess yes okay so if we're looking at a rifle at 300 yards and dropping it down to 100 yards we don't need 100 yards to get from one end of the daybell driveway to the other do we what our investigation or our um belief was, if you're asking me what my belief is? No, I'm asking you the distance down the end of the Daybell driveway to the top of the Daybell driveway. Is That's not 100 yards, right? Well, that's correct. That's all I have, Judge. Thank you. All right. All right. Mr. Wood is the State Review Call Center. You're on the committee motion. Yeah. Your Honor, may this witness leave the stand? Oh, I did not bring it up. We are. You want to sidebar first? No, we're, we're, we're done. Okay. Well, Lieutenant Colonel Sia, you may go ahead and return down. And because you are still under subpoena, may be recalled, I will admonish you to uh, abide by the court's exclusionary rule. And you're not permitted to review or review the testimony of the trial between now and the time you return from the testimony. If you fail to follow that and follow the trial or observe any testimony, you will not be permitted to testify again. All right. Sure. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you, Council. If you'll give me a moment, I want to clarify our record on exhibits admitted through that last witness and make sure the court has a clear record of what came in as it relates to exhibit 34. So we did have stipulation that on the record here and for the jurors to know as well, we had, uh, I believe 34 had separate attachments or would be separate exhibits, 34A, B, C, D, and E. Is that what 34 consists of? Yes, Judge, and the state had stipulated to the admission of all of uh, 34, which included those separate exhibits. They've already been stipulated to. Okay, and understanding they were stipulated to, but still on the record, I'm going to make clear that exhibits 34A, 34B, 34C, 34D, and 34E have all been admitted into the record in our evidence in case the state concur with that. That sounds accurate, Your Honor. Okay. Council, yeah, so when we conclude, I'll have you stick around for a minute to also see if we need further clarify as if it's on the record. Uh, at this time, ladies and gentlemen of the jury and those in attendance, I've discussed scheduling here with counsel. Uh, we got this trial started and moving along with jury selection a little quicker than anticipated, and the state is at its stage of putting on its case in chief. They're doing their best to line up witnesses to appear here coming a little sooner than anticipated, and that's the explanation. We are going to go ahead and conclude for today in order to allow the state to have a full day's worth of evidence and testimony beginning on Monday. And then next week, we should be on a full slate of Monday through Friday trial. Uh, notice also, as I mentioned previously, that tomorrow uh, is not gonna be a day of trial. So as I understand it, the state would request that we then conclude trial for the week and commence again on Monday morning. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Sure. The state has or I'm sorry, does the defense have any objection to that? No objection, Judge Dick. Okay. So before you leave then, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this is a pretty long break in between uh, evidence now that you are sworn jurors in the case. And I will again admonish you to please do everything you can to not do anything to learn about the case, investigate the case, look the case up, follow any media in the case. Uh, if you do see anything being reported, try to avoid that. Don't talk about the case to anyone else or any of the evidence or facts with anyone, including with each other. You can only do that when you start your deliberations. And when you return on Monday morning, when we'll commence at 8.30 with more evidence, I will be asking the jurors as they return to complete those admonitions and certify under uh, penalty of perjury that you have followed that instruction. So. I appreciate you doing that so far. I have confidence you will continue to do that. And thank you for your time and efforts today. That will conclude our trial for today, and we will resume again on Monday with further evidence. All rise, please. Thank you, please be seated. <clears throat> the matter on the Exhibit 34 is the court is referencing the, um, the defense trial exhibits. And 34 is listed. It says 34A through E, Alex Cox Google searches in October 2019. There's also a 34 F and a 34 G through J and a 34 K through Y. So I just wanted to make clear what came in the record today that will be admitted. We have 34 
A through E. That's correct. The other ones are yet to come. Okay. So, and I'm sorry it was confusing. I tried to do this as plainly as possible and have it all on a thumb drive so that the court can make it easier for the jury. But uh, at this point, it's only A through E. The others have been admitted, Judge. I just haven't referenced them yet. Okay. And just to be clear, even though admitted or, and, and agreed to, to be admitted by stipulation, for this record to be accurate and for future reference of the record, each time a new exhibit is referenced, uh, it needs to be just called out on the record so the clerk keeps an accurate list of what exhibits have come in and that those track with the actual exhibits. So uh, I think the system works. We just need to make sure that uh, individually, for example, with that, if there's multiple exhibits within a number, then we outline exactly what came in. That way we make sure the jury doesn't see any evidence they weren't supposed to see and they see all the evidence they are supposed to see. So we'll continue to work on that process as we start next week. Uh, before we conclude today, then, is there anything further from the state? No, Your Honor. Anything further from the defense? No, Your Honor. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone in attendance today. Also, for following the court's conduct orders. I appreciate it very much. And we'll be recess for the day. All rise, please.